Anyone here went to Standing Rock? Let's talk afterwards or have lunch tomorrow. Hello, welcome everybody to the Congressional Black Caucus. I'd like to start off by thanking Mr. George Martin and Morgan Moss, the founding fathers of the National Black Caucus for the Green Party. My name is Justice Brownlee. Yes, My name is Justice Roundtree. I'm with the Green Party's uh, Black Caucus. We, 50 years ago, this city faced um, many of the same challenges that it faces today. And we are commemorating the 50th year of the North Rebellion. We have some esteemed uh, panelists on our panel today. And I'll introduce them. We have Mr. Bob Whitneck, he's the co-founder with dozens of North and other New Jersey residents of Deconcerate the Garden State, publishes a sporadically New Jersey Deconcerator paper, recently co-coordinated several demonstrations in North and around New Jersey against escalating threats of war. He also worked recently toward trying to save Westmin Westminster Choir uh, College, where his son is a graduate and piano student. Veteran of many struggles since the late 70s when he led protests against pollution and toxic dumping around New Jersey, an organizer with the Peace Central of Central New Jersey, protested CIA and other war activities in Rutgers, U.S. intervention in Central America. He has also supported opposition to Johnson & Johnson's gentrification of New Brunswick. He has organized opposition of the Gulf War in the early 90s and then organized Carteret, New Jersey in opposition to defeat the placement of a sludge incinerator on the off the kill waterfront. In 2016, he worked with anti-enslavement activists around New Jersey to protest in solidarity with the nationwide prison strike on September 9th, the anniversary of the Attica State Uprising. We also have Ms. Jennifer McClendon here. She is a New Jersey licensed professional counselor also a New Jersey licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor, national certified counselor and approved clinical supervisor. She has worked in the New Jersey substance, I'm sorry, she has worked in New Jersey substance use and mental health services field for over 16 years. Her passion for working with formerly incarcerated individuals stems from her personal and professional experiences with recovery and reentry. She has always been an advocate, advocate, which sometimes has gotten her in trouble at home and at work. I'm sure we could be, we could uh, <laughs> uh, relate to that. But nonetheless, she is an avid learner and continues to work daily to improve her knowledge and the conditions of those most affected by trauma, substance abuse, and incarceration. We have, let me go right in succession. We have somebody who is a history, I mean, I'm sorry, he is, Mrs. Mr. Junius Williams, he is a, what I call a hero of mine. Most of my heroes are unsung, um, so, and I'm proud to say that. Mr. Junius Williams is a nationally recognized attorney, musician, educator, and independent thinker who has been at the forefront of civil rights and human rights movements in this country for decades. His life in the movement in the South and the North has been chronicled in the Civil Rights History Project, a collaborative initiative of the Library of Congress and the National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian Institute. He is one of the 11 interviews shown nationally for viewing on C-SPAN. His speeches have energized young and older alike in places like the Smithsonian Institute of Washington, D.C., the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York, Shiloh Baptist Church in Trenton and colleges throughout the country. As the youngest president of the National Bar Association, the oldest and largest organization of black attorneys in the U.S., he spoke at the United Nations advocating genuine democracy for the people of Zimbabwe, South Africa. He was listed as one of the 100 most influential blacks in America in Ebony Magazine, ran for the mayor of North, and now teaches leadership and community organization as director of the Abbott Leadership Institute at Rutgers University North, based on lessons outlined in his new book, Unfinished Agenda, Urban Politics in the Era of Black Co uh, Power. 
In 2016, he served as chairman of the North Celebration 350 Committee, uh, formed to celebrate the 350, 350th anniversary of the city of Newark. As an attorney in Newark, New Jersey, Junius Williams successfully represented Jesse Jackson in a historic court decision, making it possible to cast one vote for the presidential candidate and all his delegates, all his delegates in New Jersey in 1988. He served as the director of community development the Model Cities program uh, for the city of North New Jersey from 70 to 72, and the University Heights Development Corporation from 1988 to 93. As an advocate, planner, administrator, and developer, he is responsible for the construction of more than 2,000 units of housing in North. Junius Williams served as chairman of the Board of Trustees at Greater Abyssinian Baptist Church from, 2000, I mean, from 1990 to 2003, and the Education Law Center from 2000 to 2005. He was an official observer of the first South African national South African national election in 1994. Currently, he serves as the director of the Abbott Leadership Institute, that's since the year 2000 until current, which teaches education, advocacy, and leadership skills to North parents, students, and state, stakeholders. In 2016, he served as the chair of the historic North 350 celebration, and I could go on and on and on. This is a man that's uh, that's, that's greatly accomplished, and like I said, he's a hero of mine. Um, last but certainly not least is the esteemed Lisa Durden, somebody that I've also studied from afar and I admire very much myself on a personal note. Miss Lisa Durden is a North New Jersey resident, and she's a sought after, sought after journalist, TV personality, an award-winning producer, content creator in nonfiction television and film. In 2005, Ms. Durden launched Lisa Durden Unlimited Productions, a multimedia company headquartered in the state of New Jersey that specializes in creating award-winning content across multiple platforms for television, the web, and live audiences. Ms. Durden recently honored with the, was recently honored with the Seton Hall University Black Alumni Association's Vanguard Award for Excellence in Communications. She is brilliantly outspoken and has blazed the trail as a, su as a subject matter expert in areas of pop culture, politics, and social issues. Lisa keeps the camera hot <laughs> with her intelligent, straight-talking commentary, appearing on such nationally syndicated programs as, got to take a deep breath, is his name, as Fox News's, I'm sorry, uh, let, me, let me give it all to you. Fox News's, Tucker Carlson Tonight, Fox and Friends, The Kelly File, Megan, Megan and Kelly, HNLs, uh, the Daily Share with Melissa Knowles, iHeartRadio's American Now with Megan McCain, uh, Fox News Files with Ernie Anastas, Arise TV, uh, Pix 11 Morning News, WTNH's News 8 CT Style with host Ryan Chris, uh, Christopher and Teresa Dofor, and WABC's Radio's uh, Mr. Geraldo uh, Rivera Show, Hot 97 Street Soldiers with Lisa Evers, to name a few. In September 2015, she was featured in Rolling Out Magazine as the month black intellectual with an outspoken, straight, no chaser point of view on issues that include social justice, politics, women's issues, education, and race. And of course, just like Mr. Williams, there, there are many more accomplishments, but uh, just please give a warm welcome to all our panelists here. So we're going to discuss a few topics here today. Um, Mr. Williams is, uh, has another engagement, so he's a little short on time. So some of the questions initially will be focused for you, Mr. Williams. Okay. Um, I myself am a North resident, born and raised all my life, and I find it very interesting um, what was going on in the 60s. The North, their role, the North played, the role that North played nationally. Um, would you please? speak to some of the conditions that existed socially during the time of the 67 riots leading up to it. Uh, well, thank you all. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with the Green Party. I didn't know it was a, a national confab, but that's just as well. Uh, I'm very glad to have been invited. Uh, I asked the young lady to pass out two documents. One is a, a card about my book, which I'm going to talk about a little bit in a minute. And the other is a website you might find interesting. Uh, that's my most recent passion. It's called uh, riseupnorth.com. And in it, you will find a 
historical presentation of the Black Power Movement in the city of Newark. We intend to do that all over the country in the northern area. The project is called the North, Civil Rights and Beyond in Urban America. And we're going to take a look at uh, the black empowerment struggle. And while we do that, we're going to talk about some other people who we have intersected with, like Latinos, one shade or another, and whites, one ethnic group or another. So it might be interesting to you. Uh, the book I suggest, because we're all organizers, that's, that's the, the main common denominator of anything that I do. Uh, I am an organizer. I did most of my organizing here in the city of Newark for the past 50 years. Uh, and so the book tells my story, but it also talks about Newark and talks about how we organize and how I think we might have a template for organizing in that book, which might be helpful for what you do. So to answer the question, in 1967, there were the same problems that you would expect to find in a large, major urban center such as Newark, which had the first majority black population in the country of any big northeastern city. Washington, D.C. is known as Chocolate City, but we were chocolate before they got there. <laughs> so uh, there were housing, there were landlords who charged money for housing that should have been abandoned. We had uh, welfare bureaucrats who wouldn't give checks to welfare mothers who needed it and wanted to see if there was a man in the house, which was forbidden. We had, of course, police who were just out of control, uh, did anything they damn well pleased. We had urban renewal, which was taking up all the land they could, banking the land for developers or putting people in high-rise public housing. Uh, all of these things happened. Uh, and on one hot <coughs> August, I'm sorry, one hot July evening, on July the 12th to be exact, a cab driver dared to pull around a police car which was double parked on one of the major streets the cops didn't like that. They pursued him, pulled him over, pulled him out, beat him up, <coughs> and put him in a police car, took him to the fourth precinct, and beat him some more. This would have been an ordinary night, except that they did so in front of Haney's home, which was the most one of the most densely populated public housing projects in the country. People were out on a July night. Why were they out? Because it was hot. Hundreds of people outside because it was too hot to be in. So they did it, and this one time, people rebelled. That's why we call it a rebellion, because people did not take it. They decided to pursue this thing Old Testament style. There were several groups in town. I was here with the <coughs> SDS group called the New Community Union Project. Uh, some names you might remember, one of them important would be Tom Hayden. Tom Hayden was the one that persuaded me to come to New instead of going back down south to be with SNCC. So uh, the, the NCUP leadership was there, the UCC, which was the United Community Corporation, the local war poverty group. Uh, we had uh, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, all of these groups were in town and present that night. They were summoned to come, calm the crowd down, which people tried to do because we were nonviolent. But at one point, as uh, one of the people talks about on my website, uh, Tim Still was on the hit, was on the top of a car with a bullhorn, trying to get people to settle down. And this young man came up to him and said, "Mr. Still." We like you, but you should just come down from there because it's on. <laughs> and that's how the rebellion started, and it didn't end until some 700 people had been hospitalized, some 26 people had been killed, all by the combined police forces of the, the, the city, the state, and the, uh, the, the National Guard. Uh, millions of dollars of damage was done, and when it ended, when the smoke cleared, we realized 
we had been in power. And if I could talk about that a little bit, please do, since I, since I have to leave. I'm going on another program, WBGO is having a program, and I had committed to that first. Uh, so, I'm, so I'm sorry I won't be able to stay for so long. And that's the most important message here. I heard uh, the first black mayor of Newark on the radio yesterday uh, talking about, in answer to the question, did, uh, did the mayor, did, I'm sorry, did the uh, riot do any good? And he said, no, it was all harm. But my position was different. First of all, I was his first campaign manager, so I know a little bit about the conditions in the street. And this is Gibson, right? This is Mayor Kent Gibson, first black mayor of Newark, elected in 1970, three years from then, from, from, from the time of the rebellion. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a series of events that took place all because of the rebellion. Once the smoke had cleared and the last embers had died, people woke up and realized that the power structure was afraid of us. And so some of us who were strategic, we didn't want to see a violent rebellion, but we knew that this was the time if we were gonna do anything. So in my own case, we developed an organization called the Newark Area Planning Association <laughs> and we fought the medical school, which, at, uh, which is right up the street, I believe, if I'm pointing them in the right direction. They wanted to take 120 acres of land, which would have taken 20,000 black folks, blacks and Puerto Ricans out uh, their home. That was the size, that was the kind of urban renewal project they visited upon us to try to break up this new black majority, or this, this coming, gaining momentum black majority that was here. Uh, and to make a long story short, we beat them down. They got 60 acres, but we got 60 acres of land for housing. And that, we had 900 and some acres on that land. Eventually, uh, we were able to integrate the workforce for the first time in New Jersey and other workforces. After that, because we then, we, we were able to train people. We said, they said, well, we don't have any trained African Americans uh, and Puerto Ricans. That's who was here then. We didn't have this thing called Latinos. That was before uh, Latinos came, Puerto Ricans were here. Uh, and these were men who were working on the web on, on, the, on the site because at that time, people were not thinking about women working on the site, <laughs> on, on, on those kind of sites. So uh, we were able to bring the money to town from the state to train people. And we trained over 600 people, some of them got union books. And up until now, these were the, the black workers, the people of color, which under affirmative action, people were supposed to bring when you have a workforce of that type. Now they are retiring. What happened was the governor at that time, Governor Byrne, cut the funds. And he cut the funds after three or four years of us training people and doing very well, uh, maybe five years, because the union said, if you let this thing go to Atlantic City, and because that was when the casino industry was just starting in the mid 1970s, but we're not going to support you, Democratic government. But the mayor of Newark, Mayor Ken Gibson, should have said, if you don't let this thing go on, I'm not going to support you. But he didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So we lost the template for training people. But that came up, that was something very positive that came out of the whole process. The other thing that happened was uh, we told the medical school, you have to take care of health problems for the city of Newark. The old hospital was called Martin Meat Market. I was born there. Uh-huh, that's just the way it was. my age. And <laughs> so and that's about when it stopped, about the time you were born. Because the hospital, the, the, the new teaching hospital, which they wanted to keep clean and sanitized and only do things like heart transplants. And we had a few people that needed a heart transplant, but we had all these other things like asthma and, and uh, other conditions that are associated with the urban condition. And so we made them take care of these people. And even now, the UMDNJ 
uh, emergency room is one of the best in the state. One of the best in the state. So I say all that because something good did come out of this period. But something else came out of it which definitely impacts upon what Ken Gibson said and what you as a political party will, I'm sure, will understand. People don't vote unless they identify with you. Up until that time, Negroes didn't even want to call themselves black. This was before black power, if you will. We all in this room are used to calling black people black people. Well, back in my day, that wasn't so easy. But once the rebellion came and there was this union, this unity that developed in the city, which had never happened before. All of these groups came together. Once they saw the, the, the rampage that the cops went on killing all those 26 people, including one white fireman and one white policeman, there was a new identity process. Number two, there came greater expectations. You can't expect people to do anything unless they expect to win. After that, people start expecting to win. Number three, strategic advantage. And I told you about how that all process all started with the whole medical school fight. Well, during that period of time, just before we began those negotiations, Leroy Jones, who later became Emir Baraka, the father of today's mayor, called together a group of us who were leaders in the town and formed the United Brothers. And he said, we're going to become the, the, the main state. We're going to become the platform upon which will be seated the new first black mayor of Newark. There were about 14 black men and one black woman who was a part of the leadership of the obstacle of, of the opposition to the, to the medical school. And, and finally, uh, we had coalition building. We had an opportunity to build coalition. As a party, you understand that, you know how necessary it is to bring people who were at opposite ends of the pole. Well, as I said, there was a unity, there was a period of unity, a period like I've never seen before and won't probably see again until we achieve that kind of unity. So something or somebody or some set of incidents brings us together again. As a result of that, 73% of the eligible voters in Newark came out in 1970 to elect Ken Gibson. 73% turnout. Never happened before and hasn't happened since. It's been going down, down, down. Because those factors that I was telling you about, the first, you know, the identification, the expectations, the strategic advantage, and the coalition, was not maintained. And as a, as a party seeking to gain power, uh, I, I think you would be interested in that story. That's why I'm telling it to you today, because to, to gain power, to compete with the two big national parties, or I should say part A and part B of the one national party. <laughs> <laughs> that the city of Newark and its experience starting 50 years ago can teach you. Thank you. Yes, since I would, I would normally do questions um, towards the end of the panel, but, but due to the unique situation that, that Mr. Williams has to leave, I'll ask for a few questions and we're gonna have to go on with the, with the rest of the panel discussion. Can you comment on today, Ross Baraka's election, and, and community groups like people's organizations for progress, and how that takes it? Okay. Uh, he wants you to comment on the mayor, Raz Baraka, and the people's organization for progress. The mayor Baraka came from the household of Emir Baraka and Amina Baraka. And that was a very lively household. 
you had all kinds of people coming in the house uh, from, 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 from performers to politicians to statesmen to, to, to people from, from Africa, people from Europe, all over the place. And so as children, uh, I used to see them running around the house all the time. He was not born during the rebellion. He was born two years after the rebellion. So, uh, but as he grew up, he grew up learning what his father and mother were teaching him. Uh, today, I think he is a very intelligent man. I think he understands all of the things that I'm saying here today. The question becomes, uh, does he have the resources at his disposal to make the city good for everybody? The city's coming back because folks with the big money wanted to come back. The question is, is it gonna come back for, for people west of Broad Street. Uh, and I think we have a chance if the people are politicized and one of the groups that you, you're talking about, the People's Organization for Progress, Larry Hamm, uh, I'm gonna see him in a few minutes. Uh, he and I have been talking about uh, what was going on in, in this, this period of rebellion for some time now. Uh, but Larry Hamm's organization is the last of the Mohicans, so to speak. You don't find very many multi-purpose organizations like that that will fight uh, to, to bring the, a, a new kind of reckoning, a, a new kind of me, identity and strategic advantage as we once had back in the 60s. We'll take one more question. Hi, my name is Aniko Afori. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Well, I'm not from there, but that's where I came from. But um, I have um, been uh, working on, in my mind, for the last two years about Reconstruction and the Reconstruction Act and that period of time. And this Kwanzaa, I thought myself, the miseducation of the Negro. Um, so I would like your impression about where we are as black people, because um, I've always heard, this, heard people saying what they got from miseducation of the Negro, and after I read it, none of those people, I don't think they actually read the book. So I just would like to know what you think, uh, because I'm coming from a city that we had a 9% uh, black, voter turnout, turn, black voter turnout for our mayor's election. Um, so- Is it I, nine? Nine. Wow. And I'm, I'm, I'm in a majority, I'm in a 63% black city. So when, when they talk about Chocolate City, I don't mean there's a bunch of black people there, this is a majority black city. Right. Um, but what I, um, before you answer that, is that what I find in the theme of miseducation of Negro is our Negro leaders. And uh, not just like political leaders or like even, com uh, like I mean community leaders, but I mean like low level community leaders, like the people who are really influencing people. Um, so if you have any comment on that. Well, let's just stay within the uh, voting vein. Uh, yours is a good example of the kind of, of thing that I'm talking about. As organizations, as grassroots organizations, Flounder, we don't have as many people want to participate in the particip participate in the electoral process because they don't understand power. We understood power in the 1960s. That's what I was trying to get, get you to understand with those four points. Well, see, one thing, well, the, the big mistake that we made, we put all of our eggs into the election basket. We wanted to get the first black man the first majority council. We want to get, we want, and people want to be the first black that did this, that, and the other. And as that happened, all of the lessons that we learned from the 1960s and before the 1960s, so there was organization before the 60s, all of those lessons kind of fell apart, fell away. People don't understand it. Now it's two going on three generations who know nothing at all about organizing. So, you know, people, people look at Martin Luther King, and for example, and they say he was the, the king of peace and love. Well, that's what the media wants you to think. Dr. Martin Luther King was a brave warrior, and he came from organization. People look at the organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which I had the privilege of working with, 
And people say, what is that? That was the baddest group in America, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I still pattern my organizing around what I learned during that time. So you see, you have the absence of information, and you have misinformation, mm -hmm. and that's poisoning people. So much so that we have young people who have yet to learn where and how far to go in a certain direction. Uh, I say that because I, I, I teach young people. I, I have a group that I, I'm part of called, that, that I direct called the Youth Media Symposium. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sturton here has worked with us. We yeah. teach young people that you have, that you have a voice, <coughs> your voice can be heard better. And if then you, you get fired. If, if, <laughs> I'm just saying. You find that you, <laughs> if your, your voice will be accentuated if you learn the skills associated with the media. That's what she came in and talked to us about. Oh, yes. <laughs> but we have developed a lot of young leaders who understand power and leadership. Mm -hmm. What I find absent and, and this is something that you can talk about and you can be helpful, not just with, uh, with, with uh, Black Lives Matter, but with many organizations from many communities. People mistake mobilization for organization. Mm -hmm. Mobilization for organization. Mm -hmm. You got one of the greatest mobilization devices called Facebook and, and all those other, mm -hmm. those, all those other isms and schisms that you can talk about I don't even remember all the names of them, but you can put out the call and get people to meet you at West Market and Broad Street, mm -hmm. and you might get a couple of hundred people, but what are you going to do with them after you come? Mm -hmm. That's where organization comes in. Mm -hmm. So the skills, the, the, the work, the understanding that people have to play certain roles and that everybody can't be the leader. And, and, and some folks got to be second at this point, but maybe they'll be first the next time. Mm -hmm. All of those people who you can trust. Mm -hmm. Can you trust them 70%? Can you trust them 80%? If you get an 80% people, person, you mm -hmm. ought to suffer. Mm -hmm. You just got to just suffer that other 20% and hopefully mm -hmm. they'll come along. <laughs> but all of those are skills that you learn from being an organizer and being a part of organization. That's what young people have to learn. That's the faith of the black, that's, that's, that's the status of the black community. But as I told somebody on television yesterday, I have great faith that our young people are gonna get there. They're gonna find that. They're gonna listen, they're gonna talk, and especially those of you who are in organization and understand organization, you need to educate young people about that. And not just about getting excited and going to the demonstration and, 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 and saying, well, I'm going to take over the street. Most of the time, the people who take over the street right now, they took it over because the police let them take it over. It's not like when I was in SNCC, you see. When we were in Montgomery, Alabama, and we had three waves of people going down to the state house in Montgomery, one wave got arrested. They had so many people arrested because the second wave was coming in. They had to put some of us in state prison. Then a third wave came in. You got to know how to organize to get that done. So until that happens, and I'm not just talking about black people, so I don't want you white people to think that y'all got it made here. You got, <laughs> you got white young people who need to understand that too. Indians, Native Americans, I should have said, Latinos, Asians. People have to learn how to organize. And on that note, I'm going. Thank you for having me. Read right. the book to find some more. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, um, I'm going to open the panel up for a discussion. Whoever you know wants to grab the subject can. One thing I would like to know: I, I, there's a couple quotes that stick with me. One of them is uh, pertaining to uh, the state of Black people. I noticed that um, there are two quotes: uh, the, the the Black woman is the backbone of the struggle. That's something that always stuck in my mind. And, and another thing is, and this was from uh, Elijah Muhammad, he stated years ago that
you can tell the condition of a people by how they treat their women. And I found uh, those two statements to be true. Uh, me being an organizer myself, I noticed that um, I have an organization that consists of men and women, and, and um, I can always rely on the women. I'll come to a meeting sometime, and a lot of people won't show up and won't um, have a reason why they didn't show up, but everybody at the meeting will be, all the women will be there prepared, ready to go, and that's just a glaring example of that. And I think if you just look at um, a lot of the misogynistic uh, behavior and thing, things that are attached with not only you know black culture, American culture, but we're going to speak about uh, some black you know, specific issues pertaining um, to the state of black existence. But if you see how prevalent that is in our culture, it's clear to see why we're in the condition that we're in. So um, with that being said, I would like you know to, to get your views on um, how black women are being treated, how are, are, are black women involved enough or, or you know, uh, in discussions, when we talk about these matters, is, are, are the issues of black women concerted enough? I mean, it is the fastest growing prison population in America is black women, right? So uh, I would like to get your thoughts on that. Anybody can. Um. I can, uh, I don't know if my mic is on. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, clearly people know my story, but my story is many people, black women's story. Um, uh, I think that there is an, people not, are not noticing it, but you know, a, black women are pretty much invisible. You know, there's a lot of attention being made to uh, about the black man, which was which is important, you know, the black man is being murdered in the streets by racist cops and all of these issues around mass incarceration. And even when you saw the film Thirteen and they talked about mass incarceration, you saw black men. You know, there was no conversation about black women. When you heard about Sandra Bland, there was no big marches and TV shows made about Sandra Bland. Jay Z made a story about Khalil. Uh, um, Broder, Khalif. Broder. Khalif, uh, right, Khalif, and he's making a couple of other films. There's no film being made about that I know about Sandra Bland and those issues, um, or even things celebrating us. It's not always about you know someone being murdered, but it's just celebrating us. So I think that um, you know uh, there is I don't know if there's a something happening where we're being made to compete with each other. I've even had conversations with black men about we're the most marginalized, and I'm like I'm not trying to have a pissing contest with you. The bottom line is black women for whatever reasons, are still invisible. And uh, we need to address that, right? A lot of attention is being paid to the plight of the black man. Uh, even something as simple as uh, silencing us is happening consistently. You know, when I went on the show Tucker Carlson, uh, a lot of people in my community who stood for me and they, they, they said, yeah, girl, we got your back. And you know, you had a right to free speech and you were on that show talking about uh, you know, radical black spaces and the right to be able to assemble, which is something very common, not just amongst black people, but women, movements and LGBT communities that's been, been going on historically. And, you know, I walked away from Fox and I did my thing and I talked about this whole Black Lives Matter event that happened on Memorial Day and two black men fired me. I came back to a, a mostly black and brown city. I worked at a, a college, which of course I did not mention in the piece um, because I wasn't there to be representative of Essex County College. I was there to be Lisa Durden, a subject matter expert, no different than Nancy Grace, who is a, uh, a, a lawyer who's a TV personality, or Janine Pirro, who's a lawyer who's now a TV personality, and they get to go on shows and be experts in their field, and they separate their expertise from their personal life, which is what I should be considered like them, but I'm not. So, they, so the school, I guess, tied me to the message versus separating the message from the messenger. So I come back and I'm fired because I spoke freely and honestly about what's going on about matters of race in and around this particular day, but just race in general. Um, two black men fired me. These were black men. Now, people have asked me, what do I feel about that? Well, I didn't even know who these men were. I knew the names. I knew that um, Dr. Monroe came to teach, came to be the pr uh, president there in June. I knew that Dr. Lee 
was the vice president of academic affairs, but if I was to walk in the hallway, I wouldn't have been able to pick Dr. Lee out in a lineup. I had never met him until I was suspended. So when I found out, like, you know, people told me, these are black men that fired you, what do you feel about that? You know, I felt like other people felt that's questionable, but I felt like, well, I just wanted to work and do a good thing for students there and care about students. I didn't think about race when it came to work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm always asked that over and over again because this is a fact of the matter. So I'm not going to say what I feel I'm going to ask that question. The question is, how does something like this happen? I'm just going to throw the question out there in the, in the hemisphere. How does it happen? How does a person who is an African American woman speaking out about the matters of race that's important and I'm fired for it by two black men? That's just a question and being punished for my free speech. So we're silenced often. And so it's not that we're in the streets being murdered as much as African American men. It's not that we wanna compete with the plight of black men, but we're being ignored and we're, we're invisible. So you just killed me, right? So you killed me vocally, you killed me financially. So I'm not physically murdered, but if you kill somebody physically, it's a little bit different than killing somebody financially, spiritually, morally, um, uh, emotionally, this is a different kind of murder that's happening to black women. Even as much as, I won't name names, but a, a young lady decided to write a letter to the school because she was outraged at what happened to me. She said, you know, Professor Durden, I'm gonna write this letter to the school about what I feel about this, and she's in a, an organization that's all about empowerment. And so she wrote the letter, and she sent me the letter to read it. I said, this looks great, thank you. And she, I said, yeah, I appreciate it. So then, maybe like two hours later, she said, oh, someone in my organization read the letter and thought it was too long. What do you think? I said, not to be funny, but was that a man? <laughs> Did a man read that letter and tell you it was too long? <laughs> LOL. And then she said, yes. Yeah. I said, well, did that man write that letter? Did that man do all the work to put that letter together? With, you were citing historical facts and data. You read all the stories about me and you put in facts about my situation and you spent the time to do thought and energy to put into that letter and the man read it and told you it was too long. You need to stop letting men leave you because he's trying to silence you. The letter was written because, clap for that please, clap for that. I said, I said you made the decision to write the letter. That man could have written me a letter. He didn't write me a letter. You want to write me a letter and he's gonna chop your letter back. I said, I read the letter. If I felt it was too long, you're talking about your feelings toward me, I would've said it's too long. So you're questioning yourself because the man said it was too much. So I'm sick of that. And it happened to be a black woman and a black man told her to shut up, in essence. So I think we need to start talking about this within our community too, about how we know mainstream does it, right? We're invisible to mainstream. Our beauty is invisible. We're not, the way I look is not the sign of beauty. Nappy hair, big lips, big nose, brown skin. I'm not considered beautiful, so we had to make black girls rock. That was pretty beautiful to me. I think I look kind of cute today. What do you think? I know. Um, you know, you know, you know, um, we had to make something called black girl magic, hashtags. We had to create a hashtag called Black Lives Matter. Because people want to question about this thing called black lives. All lives matter. Well, we know all lives matter. But somebody didn't get the memo, clearly. <laughs> so we know this. So in particular, however, I think if we need to, we need to start looking at also the plight of the black woman. We are silenced in many different ways. Not just from the larger community, but also because of the racism and the, the pathology of it, it's also causing it within the race. So this black man silences black women. Those black men, some say, I'm still trying to figure it out, but some say those black men silence me. Those black men, Dr. Lee and Dr. Monroe, silenced me. And I want, and I always tell people in my community when they've reached out about my particular situation, but there's many others, not just mine, but I'm, a, I'm an example of that, is when you, oh, you know, Fox is racist and Fox, we don't like them. And, Tucker Carlson did all those things and we hate him. Well, that's true. But I was not fired by Tucker Carlson. I was not silenced by Fox. I was fired 
by Dr. Jeffrey Lee. I was fired by Dr. Anthony Monroe. And what was interesting is, I mean, you can search the quotes, but what's interesting is they saw the clip, I'm assuming, and this man, Tucker Carlson, called the black woman a Nazi, and they weren't outraged. Look at the clip. He called me a Nazi. He called me demented. He called me sick. He called me a racist. And he called me, um, I forgot one other word. I'll think of it in a second. So all of that lived in that clip. And when I got back to Newark, New Jersey, those black men fired me. So what's interesting is now the racist alt-right also agrees, see, their own people fired her. We're right. We're correct. It, see, it reinforces the pathology. It reinforces the racism. This is what's going on with black women. And I'm not the only one around the country who's been fired because our voices were heard in academia as, a, as an adjunct. It's a, it's a big, I found out as a professor, it's a thing. I didn't realize until I got fired it was a thing. I'm like, this is a thing? You know, I'm just trying to, you know, do a good thing in the city of North. So it's a thing. So we should be very concerned also, and I keep saying also, so don't know black men want to fight me saying, but you know, in addition to the black male plight, we need to talk about women of color, especially black women in particular. We are being silenced and we are being marginalized. And I think it was um, uh, uh, Farrakhan who said, the black woman is the most disrespected woman, woman, disrespected person on earth, most abused person on earth, and most ignored. Something like that. Look it up. I forgot the exact quote. This is a fact even in 2017. So this is a, a concern. So when we are not talking about the mass incarceration and we don't see the black female faces who are the fastest growing population in the prison system now, that's a concern of mine. When we don't see that black women are being silenced like Sandra Bland, that's a concern of mine. When we don't see that black women are making, you, you're making sure that we are maintaining our position as professionals like Lisa Durden and many others as professors where they see my face and these students can see you know, what, what is to be in the media, and I can be that example of that. And I'll say this, and, and then she can, you can jump in. When um, we, an organization called Education, Educators and Students <coughs> United to, re, to reinstate Professor Lisa Durden, go on um, uh, change.org and just type in reinstate Professor Lisa Durden, and please, you know, sign a petition. Um, so I found out they, they had this petition started, so I'm going to these, you know, rallies and things that they're starting. So I went to, uh, uh, the recent um, Essex County Chosen Board of Freeholders meeting on June 6th. The Chosen Freeholders of Essex County pays for the college. That's where the budget comes from. The county pays for Essex County College. So members of Pop and those guys said, let's go and tell your story. There was an interesting lady that came to the microphone named Cassandra. I, I forgot. I'm like, oh, Cassandra? <coughs> What's the last name? Doc. Cassandra Doc, we were, I'm like, Cassandra Doc, I haven't seen you since high school. She heard about my story and she said on the microphone, which I hadn't thought about until Ju July 6th. She said many things, but one she came, she said, you fired Lisa Durden for speaking her mind and facts about what's going on here in terms of race, radical safe spaces, why Black Lives Matter felt the need to have a safe space and, and excluded uh, people uh, who are not of color in the reasons why. And I, she said, I saw the Tucker Carlson clip. I went to high school with Lisa Durden, and I'm looking, I'm like, oh yeah, we sure did, girl. And then she said, but I never knew Lisa Durden was a professor until you fired her. I never knew she was a professor at Essex County College until you fired her. So what do you mean students called the school? What, what does Dr. Lee mean, a, a Dr. Uh, Monroe mean? Students and parents and, 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 and uh, 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 faculty and pr prospective students, which is quote, I think, uh, potential students, all called the day I was on there and they were, you know, scared or outraged or whatever the thing is, and they, they wanted to know. She said, but how would they have known she was a professor there if they, she didn't say she was a professor there? It's the summertime. She said, I didn't know. So that was very, Insightful. yeah, so, I, so she raised some issues for me. So these are all the things I'm, I'm thinking in my mind that people are raising that I'm not thinking of. So I find those things very curious. So you gotta think deeply about African American women and women of color in general, not just you know Lisa Durden, but many others. So I look at myself as a Sandra Bland, only I'm still walking around for now. 
um, because people have threatened my life from being on the show. In fact, actually, living is more painful than dying. Because when, you, when you're dead, you're peace. When you're living, you're in a life of hell. And not that I want to, I'm not trying to commit suicide, I'm okay. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, it's, no, 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 if I, if, listen, if, listen, you know, I, I need some counseling, girl. But, um, but the point of it is, is that she didn't know she was going to die that day either. So why weren't we outraged enough about this woman's life? Where are, and I, I'm a filmmaker, and I don't have a budget. I would love to do the Sandra Bland story. I would love to get a budget and somebody to invest in me producing the Sandra Bland story. You know, I don't have any big name people behind me. I, I've worked for other producers who've done stories as a paid producer, and those shows have been on the Sundance channel. I worked as a producer for Mark Levin and, and um, Forrest Whitaker on the docuseries Brick City About North. I worked on a documentary called Soul Food Junkies that was on national PBS and then TV One for Byron Hurd. I worked on a project called um, uh, The North Project. I just got hired in January to uh, uh, conceive and produce and develop the Twitter chat for a gigantic documentary called The Maya Angelou Film for PBS and WNET. So I need to be the one that is given um, uh, funding to produce these kinds of stories because these are the stories I care about. No one does. I am that voice. So, you know, this is an issue. slightly different approach than Lisa did, only because I have um, a lot of adoration for um, my maternal grandmother. Uh, she was born in 1923. Um, her grandfather was a college professor, and I think those things were passed down to me and my other siblings because I think most of us are pretty intelligent, <laughs> and most of us have degrees. But to talk about um, the image of the black woman um, and watching um, my grandmother with her own children and how she handled myself and my sister and my mother, who is her oldest child. Um, my grandmother was subjected to a lot of different things, of course, being born in 1923. I don't need to kind of explain to you what her life looked like. Um, not once did I ever see my grandmother cry um, I never saw my grandmother get angry with anyone other than her children and her grandchildren. <laughs> and I never saw my grandmother get upset when she didn't have something that she needed. Um, what I saw her do is just rightfully take up ownership in her community and in her home. And I watched her strive to create the life and the space that she wanted to live in. And when I get discouraged, because there's been many times that I have gotten discouraged, um, my generation, I was born in the, in the 70s, um, this teenage parent epidemic thing started to happen <laughs> to me and my classmates. So I became a teenage parent too. And uh, my family um, carried a lot of pride, I think because of some of their um, accomplishments and their ability to withstand a lot of the things that were thrown at them. But for some reason, when I became um, pregnant as a teenager, my family looked at me like I did this God awful thing. And then I had to look at how old my grandmother was when she got pregnant with my mother. She was 15. My mom was gonna kill me if she. Did <laughs> 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 I repeat this, but it's okay. It's all good. I won't tell them. So that's right. Don't no, we won't tell? I had to look at um, a generational issue that occurred in my family. And, and while I understood my family being upset about it, I, I understand now as an adult that they were upset because they didn't want me to experience the things that they had experienced. So in response to um, the plight of the black woman, I think the problem is, is that um, we're beat up a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. Um, we're invisible to our own men and to other men. I think it's expected from men of other races. I think it hurts a lot more when it comes from men that look like us. Um, I think a lot of us understand um, the divide and conquer strategies that are used that allow that to take place. But my message to the black women, if there were a lot of them here this evening, would be the same thing that I saw my grandmother do, to not complain and to just take up your space and your ownership in your life because those things are going to exist and they're going to happen no matter what. 
And I think when we get caught up in um, the sadness and the emotional responses that we all um, can have sometimes when we shut down and shut people out, um, we stop our own growth, we stop contributing to our communities, we are worthwhile and we are valuable. I think that we just need to continue to do what we need to do and let the other stuff just kind of wash away on its own. And I know that's a pretty profound statement. And the only reason why I'm saying that is that's because how I live my life every day. Um, I kind of don't have a choice. I have taken on the role of a mental health counselor and a substance abuse counselor. So I don't have many moments where I get to break down and kind of fall apart because I'm always responsible for helping someone else. But I still have to take care of me in the process. So I, I learn a lot from working with other people and helping other people. Um, I don't take for granted that others allow me to share in their pain. Um, I'm happy that for the last 16 years, I've been able to build that type of rapport with different people. Many people who did not look like me, right. which was my only concern. I would like to help my community more, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done there too, um, especially with black women. The expectation is that we hold it all in hold it together and that we move forward no matter what. But we're in pain, we need help, whether we're married, single, separated, children, no children. The, the black women are in pain. And I'm saying that because I need people to understand mm -hmm. that. You have the angry black woman syndrome, you have, oh, she's too educated, she thinks that she's better than us. It's a lot of different stereotypes that yep. get thrown on us. Yep. And I'll give you um, one example, I think the most intense example um, of racism that I've ever experienced in my life. Um, for I'm born and raised in Atlantic City, and um, after a period of time of working um, in Newark and some other areas in North Jersey, I moved back to Atlantic City to work. Um, that was a very um, happy time for me because I create all of my trouble came from Atlantic City without um, boring you with the details of my trouble. <laughs> <laughs> tell me more, tell me yeah, more. <laughs> so I had a supervisor who, um, whatever was wrong with my supervisor, he wore um, some kind of electronic device in his pocket and there were two things on the back of his head. And now that I think about it, I think he was receiving ECT at work if anybody knows what electric convulsive therapy is. But he was a very hateful man. He was a part of um, a gang and some other things. And, and he and I just did not have a good relationship. Um, I knew racism existed, but I had never experienced it so up close and personal every day. Um, he was very abusive. Um, he isolated me from the rest of our team. Um, he never really acknowledged any of the work that I did. Um, even if I got compliments from other people or from people outside of the organization, he refused to see me as a complete person. And, and for a period of time, I thought, well, what could I do differently? And then one day I kind of realized that there was nothing that I could do differently. The problem didn't lie with me. The problem was with him. Um, I even went to the CEO one day and I kind of spoke out of turn. Like I said, sometimes being an advocate has, has gotten me in trouble at work. <laughs> but I went to the CEO and I asked him, I said, why did you hire this man? Just very matter of a fact, like why did you hire him? And um, he gave an answer, but he started to, to tear up. And here was this man in his late 60s who, who's had a career in social work for almost as long as I've been on this earth. And when I saw the tears in his eyes, I realized that he was just, just as much affected by this man's behavior as I was. But my concern was the consumers and the other staff members and how the whole agency was affected because this man was the clinical director. He was over our, our entire agency. So eventually I moved on from that job because I realized that it was time for me to go. I had outgrew the job and me, Forcing myself to try to stay somewhere where I had outgrew resulted in me making the pain worse. So I had to, you know, accept that responsibility as an adult and I moved out of that space. And less than a year after me leaving, he relapsed and his funeral was earlier this year. Some people from the job had called me and they said, you know what, Jennifer, guess what? So and so, you know, passed away. And I, they thought maybe that I would take some pleasure in hearing about his, this man passing away. I thought about his grandson and his daughter 
who he tried his best to take care of and how they were also affected by his behavior. And it dawned on me then that this person was a really, really sick individual. Mentally, physically, spiritually, he was sick. And, and then I had to ask myself, with all my experience and training, how come I didn't see that in the beginning? What was it about that was going on with me that I missed that in him? Because had I took that approach, his behavior wouldn't have, wouldn't have affected me as much. So my point in all that is that we're going to be ostracized. We're going to be talked about as black women. We can't allow that to stop us from doing the work that needs to be done. We still need to hold on to the values and traditions in our families. We still need to work on helping our communities. And even more so, when your own community pushes you away because you're too strong and you're too powerful for them. That happens. Because that happens. I know. You still need to stand with them because believe it or not, they are benefiting from your strength. For whatever reason and whatever situation they are in, they can't show it publicly. You know, they can't support everything that you do. These are just revelations that I've had over the last um, two and a half years since I, le I, lo I left this job. Um, and I hold on to them every single day because I need to do it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to branch off on my own and develop my own business for myself, for my personal income. I'm also working on building my own nonprofit organization as well. Those things aren't easy, but those are things that I should have did years ago. And when I look back now, instead of wasting my time fighting with the supervisor, I should have been working on those things. Mm -hmm. So I, it's not that I'm, I'm blaming myself for his behavior. I'm just looking at what my options are. I have options available that aren't available to some of the black women in my community. And if I continue to move forward and set an example, maybe one or two of those people will follow along. Yeah. Or if not, maybe they'll bring somebody else to the table that will follow in my footsteps as well. So it's a very, very heavy load to carry being a black woman. But I look at, my grandmother didn't die until she was in her 90s. And I pray that I make it that long. So on those days when I feel like giving up and I want to call people a bunch of assholes and a, a lot of other, you know, inappropriate I learned a new word, ass, 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 on the internet, I said, ass hat, man, that's funny. Yeah. So, I'm a new phrase, ass hat. Yeah, that's so. funny. <laughs> um, in closing, when I feel that way, I go back to my grandmother because her memory is what carries me through those moments. And um, I'll try not to call anybody an ass hat, Lisa. I don't know. Okay. Don't like okay, I'm, I'm with you, girl. Let's not be like, let's not be mean. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm done. Hey, Bob, you still over down there? Yeah, I'd like to ask you as well. All right. So, all right, I just want to make sure you still. I'm, I'm, but, I'm following. Cool, we're good. Um, I like but, but what I would like to say is, as a black man who has been through the journey of um, um, black people are victims in, in, a, in, a, in a large way. And I, I don't like to use that term. What, yeah. what it registers with right. people, like what we know as victims, but I just like to deal with the reality of uh, our history in this country is that um, we was, we've been, you know, our, who we were was just taken from us, and it was illegal um, for me to read, not me personally, but for us to read, to educate ourselves about who we are, anything related. I, we couldn't even look uh, white people in the eyes. That's just a reality of what it was to be strung up and hung. So. When you strip a people, you know, men and women and children down to being the lowest level of existence that they can. And then, you know, it's like, okay, go free, right? And, you know, so our issues, we've been subjected to things to where I had to go through a process myself of educating myself about who I am, where I come from, and with that process came my um, uh, respect and my recognition of the role that black women played, right? So to this day, most people don't even understand who they are, the role that they play, so it's, it's, it's not a conscious decision, right? To it, it's, it's systematic, right? It's not you or I. Racism, um, anytime black people have stood up in America to define themselves, they've been attacked and destroyed. And that's in 2017 with Lisa Durden, and that's from day one when we arrived in America. 
And it's always gonna be like that because it's in place as a system, right? So even if you have the best intentions in the world, right, but you have a job that requires you to meet certain quotas or requires you to uh, execute certain duties, you're gonna uh, further that agenda. So when those black men at the college who are funded by the freeholders, mm -hmm. right, they are functioning on behalf of a system. So even though they have black faces, right, they still have a systematic racist ideology that they're carrying out. And this, and, and it, it gets deep and it gets very psychological, but that's what it is. And the important thing is that we don't, that when I say victims, that we understand that their miseducation is what causes that. They're trained, you know, they're following a system, whether it's conscious or subconscious, is what, so it's not that, it's similar to what you said about the person that you was working for, not to get caught up in an individual battle with them, but to understand the larger picture that, you know, the, what, what the things that are at play here. So even though, they bring it back home, even though it was black men, these are, these are black men that, that weren't conscious of who they are, right? And they were more um, executing a systematic agenda, right? They were protecting the interests. We can't always assume a person's not conscious of who they are. Right, but we, I'll tell you I'm, one just thing. Saying, I'm just pointing out there, I'm just, I'm, just right. saying, I'm just saying, as a person, I'm into accountability and the responsibility. Right. So while that's cool as a notion, we are quick to jump to excuses for why people don't stand up for what's right. Mm -hmm. right. Too much, I'm not saying there isn't sometimes right. an excuse. So I'm gonna say challenge yourself to not always go to the easy thinking called they don't know what they're doing or they don't understand that or somebody's pulling the string. Some people do know what they're doing. They're very right. conscious of that and they meant to do it. I can't speak for those two gentlemen in particular. I'm talking generally. That's the truth, right. So the fact of the matter is, it's not as simple as people don't know. Right. And also too, I'm, my mother raised me, when you're grown, you do what grown folks do. So my mother taught me, when you're a grown woman, you're responsible for yourself. So right. I look at any grown man or grown woman making a decision, it's your decision and you're responsible for that decision only. Right. So that's just how I live. So I'm not going to try to skirt the possibility that not just those gentlemen, but anybody knows what they're doing. We need to stop saying that, especially when it comes to excusing black people right. from hurting other black people. It's 2017. It's not that simple. I think I'm going to play devil, devil's advocate on that one. I think the idea of anybody hurting anyone is an issue. So I think when you say that True. the idea of black people hurting black people, I'm thinking about all the statistics that they have about African American people in general. Um, African American men were said they were, were said to be the group that were going to kill more of themselves than any other group. So when you think about the black woman and her being invisible, she gave birth to the black man. So it kind of makes sense why we're invisible. Well, black They're women and black us, men get both. They both They're blaming birth. us for giving birth <laughs> to a group of people who are marginalized, discriminated against, so forth and so on. So it kind of makes sense why we're treated the way we're treated. I think that us hurting each other is wrong. I think other people hurting um, other people is Correct. wrong. Correct. I, I, I think I, I just come from a diff, different dynamic, probably because of the work that I do. I just understand things that in a more objective and, and broader level. I experience, I almost expect other races to be racist against me. When my community is racist against me, it hurts me, but I understand that as well. I don't make excuses for them, because like you said, individual choice is individual choice. But you I said in your, your presentation that we have options and choices. Right, so I, was, I, I understand why this person that looks like me, comes from the same neighborhood as me, probably grew up next to me, is in the same room with me and won't speak to me. I had to learn through my own development not to get angry at that person and not well, try to go back. it's bigger than speaking, I mean, I yeah. know, well, it's bigger to, than speaking. We're, we're talking about something bigger than speaking. Like, who cares if a person doesn't speak to me? I really don't care, you're not my friend. I don't care about those small things. And I'm, I am speaking very broadly too, so I'm, I'm, I'm very much out of the box in terms of this. That's what I'm saying. We can't just only continue to say those things. We all know as an African-American people that where the, where the pathology comes from. <coughs> We now have to stop only bringing that up as a 
the reason and talk about other things called you have choices as a human being not to harm people. And like you said, it can be anyone, right? Bullies in school, those kids do know better not to bully. They mean to bully. So we have to stop only talking about the slavery piece and only talking about uh, the piece of coming from an oppressed people because we all know that. We know that at nauseum, we have, to, we have to continue to make sure we don't forget those things, but look at some other elements called personal accountability, which has a place in the conversation. So I am looking at all of that. And we, women didn't have those men. Women and men came together to birth people. Women, are, we keep blaming women. When you say women birth them, no. The woman and the man birthed that child. So I want to challenge us not to only continue to talk about the things we've been saying for a thousand years. We know that already. Now what are we going to do to turn it around? Because we are knowledgeable. We, we do know better. We talk about this at nauseum, but we keep harming each other. Not just in our community, but just people in general. Right. I, you know. I'm sick to of that, no, To that point, to the, uh, and like I said, there, there's so many complexities to it that there mm -hmm. is no one thing. Right, right. there's no but right. We need to, right. I, I think it is, right. I, I think it is careful to, um, what is new, what is it? I'm not a scientist here, so I'm gonna go out on the limb. Right? <laughs> um, so I'm gonna need a little help, right? But what is that thing that when something is put in motion, right, it'll continue to go in motion. Moment. Unless, what is Moment. it? Moment. Right, but there was like an equation or something. Yeah. And, object in motion, it stays in motion. Right, outside and even though it's 2017, and we're talking about things that happened hundreds of years ago, it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. like people still, like the same things that were effective in 1555 are still in place today because mm -hmm. nothing has really came and interjected mm -hmm. in, in, on some of us. Like I've, I've been blessed enough to be able to resurrect myself through books like Carter G. Woodson's Wish, you know. <laughs> Carter G. Woodson's Bitch Education and the Big Bro. It was a, a resurrection of myself, but had I not taken that action, I would have still been in the same Mm -hmm. Destructive you thinking. Take, you got to take action. Exactly. Year after year, mm -hmm. it would have been perpetual. So until and unfortunately, there there are things. So I definitely am about accountability and everything. But it, 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 uh, to sum it up, I think the enemy is a quote. But the enemy has kind of turned us into him um, right. in a lot of ways. But but there's not to take from any point you, you that was made here, right? Right. There, there, it's a complex it's thing. Right. You, there are some many people, items. black conscious people that that you know people are aware of these things and do do harm consciously. So there's a lot to discuss. Um, thank you though for that for that topic. We're gonna move on. Uh, I'm gonna take questions and well go ahead. Let's let's let's. Hi. Um, thank you very much for sharing your experience. I mean, I agree with everything you said. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's in your community or your workplace or whatever environment. But you are before the Green Party in the United States, so I'm thinking about political power. And I'm thinking about, um, and I'll admit that I voted for Barack Obama when he first came around because he was the change that we could believe in. And I was really hoping that he was going to usher some change around issues that were relevant and pertinent mm -hmm. to the black community. And the first term passed, and I said, well, you know, he's just getting in there, he has to learn how to do some bipartisan stuff and negotiations. The second term passed, and we're not seeing those changes. And then in particular, when we started seeing the Black Lives Matter movement come into play, I was hoping that he was going to step up, and he didn't do that, right? And so we have such an opportunity moment here in the United States of America, right, to frame 
right? We have this general broadcast, and the members of the mosque will listen in to Farrakhan and his um, assistant preachers. And they're there stating that they were not going to vote for either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, that really there was no candidates there to vote for. But yet, I'm not hearing them talk about Jill Stein or the Green Party. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you is one, what is, again, what is this gonna take to rise um, and gain some political power as black people? But also, what can we as a Green Party do to help? Well, for, I'm gonna speak, um, I'm gonna answer your question, but I also wanna be honest with you. I'm not a political person. I think a lot of the issues that we're talking about, there's no political solution to them. And maybe that's just because of what I've seen with history. Um, I was not aware prior until, I wanna say last year, that the Green Party existed. And I'm not ashamed to admit that. I'm not a political person. My first time voting in a presidential race was in 2008. Because prior to, prior to that, I could only vote in whatever um, local elections. I didn't have the right to vote. So the first presidential race that I was able to vote in was in 2008 for Barack Obama. And I was happy, one, to be able to vote, two, I was happy that the person that was, was running for president was considered African American because there was a lot of controversy about what um, Barack Obama's race was. So when you say, um, what can the Green Party do? I am not a fan of any particular party. I'm a fan of the results. So I wouldn't care if you were a party that just called yourself blank. If you're going to get done what we need to get done, then I'm all for it. Specifically, what I would like to see, I would like to see in the state of New Jersey, I would like to see some of our prisons closed. Not because other states... <laughs> Not because other states have campaigns to close prisons, but because we have three prisons that need to close. New Jersey State Prison in Trenton needs to close. Yeah. East Jersey State Prison in Rawway needs to close. And Bayside State Prison in Cumberland County, New Jersey needs to close. There is no more discussion about reforming the system. There's no more discussion about trying to put a makeshift TC program or GED program inside the prison. They need to go. And the people who are eligible for parole and that need to come home, they need to come home. Yes. And they need to be reunited with their families and whatever resources they need to be better parents, then they need to be given those things. It shouldn't be a matter of applying for a grant and worrying about whether or not that grant's going to keep getting renewed year after year. So I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not attacking the Green Party. Please don't take it that way. I'm not saying that that's what I want you to do. But I'm saying that that's what our state needs to do as a whole. All, all of our political parties need to be working on those issues. So, and so until we, until we can see some changes on that level, I know there's a campaign right now to close Jamesburg, but what about the parents of the kids in Jamesburg? Because where the, once the kids come home, who are they coming home to? Because their parents are in some of the facilities that I just named. So it doesn't just affect one group, it affects all of us. It affects the work that I do as well. Because I work with the family, I work with the child that hasn't seen his father or his mother in 15 or 20 years. I work with the wife and the mother who doesn't know what to do with the kid that's locked up and the father that's locked up or her brother that's locked up, the uncle that's locked up, the nephew that's locked up, and she's supporting all of them. So we have a really, 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 really big problem with using incarceration as a way of correcting social problems. We need to change that. Those people need to be able to come home and the people who rely on a career in corrections to feed their family, they need to either gain some other skills and join the rest of us in the workforce, or they need to find something else to help them. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to but I would like to frame this and to speak Sure. Because I, I know that you have an extensive history uh, being uh, against against wars, right? And. Uh, most of the wars uh, that, I, that I, I saw that you were involved in were wars overseas, huh. wars that we have overseas. Yeah, of course, the war at home. Right, that's, that's, yeah. that's exactly where I was going with it, um, the war at home. Oh. 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 I just got shot. Yeah. Yeah. I got so excited, I'm going to get to the yeah. boom. Oh my God. 
Yeah, he can't bounces. wait to get at this point. Okay. He bounces good. He bounces good. He bounces good. Clap for Terry. Let's go. 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 let us go what the Green Party can do to, in my opinion, improve its effectiveness in organizing in New Jersey <clears throat> around some of these issues. Now, I think that the party that's going to be successful in this country is the party that goes to the people and doesn't say, here's my platform, this is why you should vote for me. I think the party that's going to be successful in New Jersey and throughout the country is the party that organizes tirelessly endlessly about effectively to try to get some of these gains. And then, by the way, we have a party and we're running for election. But if you lead with, here's my, here's my uh, position, here's this and that, we, need, we, we are not going to get support from people who are dying every single day until we start to meet the immediate needs of these communities, mm -hmm. the day-to-day -day struggles to survive. So, so um, I mean, the, the Green Party's got the right position on the issues, yes. but we need to figure out how do we organize and how do we um, move forward. Now, the, the Carceret Garden State, when we first started, we had a, 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 a roving panel discussion, and, and we didn't just say, we didn't just go into communities and say, here, we know everything about mass incarceration, come to our meeting. That's not the right role to play. Um, the, the, the way my suggestion would be that if you're going to pursue, like, if you were going to have uh, a campaign in New Jersey that really tried to put some seeds down in the most oppressed communities of New Jersey, which I think is the only way we're ever going to win because the super oppressed are the only people capable of leading the kind of movement that we need to make the kind of changes that we need because the super oppressed know what the issues are and they know what the stakes are because, because if, if these if we don't win anything, they're dying. You know, I mean, climate change and war are very important issues. And war has always been my main thing, and it's a big issue. But because um, because we could end up blowing up the world, everyone dies. Same thing, climate change. The whole world ends. But um, people are dying today and tomorrow from mass incarceration, uh, joblessness, uh, poverty, um, lack of uh, health care. Um, so so. The way to go about organizing, I, in my opinion, the, way we, the model that we followed is we would try to first reach out and, and analyze what community you want to have a meeting in. What are the groups that are doing stuff there? What are the issues that are going on in that community? And, and you, try to, um, you try to reach out to those folks. You don't even set up that meeting until you have some people from that community on the ground involved in organizing the event. Um, and that you combine the issues of for example, mass incarceration with what's going on in that community. Um, what are the, uh, uh, some local issues to connect it to? And then you make sure that that community is represented from, from the get-go. Where is the meeting gonna be? Don't, just, don't go, you know, you come up with suggestions, but let the community decide. They know where people will come. Mm -hmm. um, our very first meeting was in front of City Hall. Our, we had a panel discussion in the streets. Um, and, and it was very uh, widely, uh, attended, and, and then we followed that, we, not all the events were in the streets, but that, you know, you can do it in the streets, you can do it in a park, you can do it in front of a, uh, where, where you have uh, some random people join you, etc. And you can put a panel discussion together in the streets. Um, so so um, my recommendation would be, uh, as far as trying to build the uh, Green Party, like, um, and I want, I want to speak, we got Seth here, the next governor of New Jersey. Um, <laughs> Now, now we, don't, we don't know that, that Murphy's saying pot's going to be legal as soon as uh, the Democrats get elected. But the cities in New Jersey are pretty much run by Democrats. New Jersey is one of 16 states that's actually increasing the number of people arrested for pot every year. 25,000 New Jersey people get arrested for pot. So why don't we say, why doesn't the Green Party say to the Democrats, hey, we want to work with you and let's start 
by dismissing immediately a thousand charges against people facing charges for violence. Let's just dismiss the charges. All the Democratic-led cities, let's stop, let's de deprioritize, deprioritize cannabis immediately. Not, don't, let's not wait for the election. We can do this today. We can have a war in Congress today. And we can call upon the Democratic-run cities to do that. Asbury Park has done something to this event. Not as far as they should go, but, but they have taken some steps in this direction. The rest of the state, the, the demand should be made. And we should say, look, we can do this now. You want to legalize Papo, but we want to, we, we need, we, we need, we need a, the prosecutors when the police bring these arrests in and throw them on the ground. No, I'm not prosecuting this. That's, that, that has to start immediately. We, um, New Jersey has a 12 to 1 ratio of the likelihood of going to prison black versus white. The worst in the nation, New Jersey, the worst in the nation, this is according to the sentencing project. Now, this study came out a year or two ago, a year and a half ago. And did anyone in the office say, okay, we got this 12 to 1 study. Let's break it down. Let's go. Uh, county by county, courthouse by courthouse, police department by police department, and find out where is this discrepancy coming from. Now, it's not all because of individual racism. A lot of it's because of systemic issues, etc. cetera. But, um, and let's analyze who's in prison. Now, if, if you represent a city or a town, you should know everyone, right? And you should know who's in prison, too. And you should, and they, they're part of your constituency. Now, if you know that somebody's in prison and has a longer term sentence because some racial factors were applied somewhere along the way, shouldn't you want to find out and, and provide some sentencing relief? There was no politician that said, took this study and said, we need to have some immediate sentencing relief based on this uh, study. I think the Green Party can say that. We want some immediate sentencing relief based upon the 12 to 1, worst in the nation, likelihood of ending in prison if you're black versus white in New Jersey. Uh, yeah. uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, with that, what you're suggesting, and I'll take, we'll take questions in one minute on this subject, after Bob has an opportunity to speak on the subject. What you're saying uh, is almost fitting to the, the category of reform. Again, when we're talking about um, you know, the people sentencing, but how do you, what do you think about, what is, what is realistic about shutting a prison down? Well, well, basically I'm an abolitionist, okay? Uh, and Let's hear it for abolitionists. Incarceration is enslavement. This is about enslavement. The 13th Amendment, we all know that. Enslavement wasn't ended. Um, we need to fight for systemic change. We need to, we need, in the, in the back of our minds, we need to be revolutionaries. We need revolutionary change, okay? But that's never going to happen. It's never going to happen until, until we organize across the board. And you're not going to make any headway with super oppressed if you're not winning and surviving till tomorrow, right. okay? So that's why you have to fight for reforms at the same time of keeping your revolutionary vision intact. Yeah. So, because you don't win folks, I'm not saying that we should be, win folks off, it's not a good way to put it, but we, we are not gonna or, organize and gain support unless we're surviving from today to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And there's folks who don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. And if we talk to them about, well, come the revolution, all these problems are going to go away. Well, the people have been saying that for decades. I mean, I thought the revolution was coming at some of the marches I went to back in the 80s. But, you know, we're still, you know, waiting for that. Um, we can't wait for the revolution. We need to win immediate reforms, close those prisons. And, and then some, we, we need to set some goals, 50% uh, reduction. Um, of the prison population. The parole, we gotta analyze the whole across the board who's in prison, who should be aging out of prison, parole who should never should be, destroyed. Be, what's that? Parole should be destroyed. These are people making over $100,000 a year. They're not hired, right? They're appointed by the governor. So they have no like checks and balances. Um, me personally, you know, I, I was incarcerated. Many people know my history. I was incarcerated for 23 straight years from 1993 to 2016. I have firsthand knowledge of the parole board. Um, I was somebody that didn't have any infractions for over a decade. And just because of the, the, the humongous sentence that I never should have received that I did receive, thanks Bill Clinton, um, 
I'll just receive an extra hit. I mean, they don't care. There's no accountability. There was no way to appeal it. I mean, the appeal process. So, I mean, when we talk about, you know, anything dealing with the parole board, they should be eliminated. Either you did your time and you're out or not. Yeah, we, we, what, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we need, we need to, the, 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 after the 12 to 1 report came out, what should have happened, this, we should analyze the entire population and figure out who should get out immediately. Who should have their uh, time, uh, uh, um, sentence um, to time serve released immediately? Who should have their sentences reduced? Who, who, who had a racial factor? And there needs to be some, there needs to be some, some that's, that, that's a, a, a tremendous thing to happen and, and, and there was not a peak. Right. I mean, there, there is a, there, right. yeah. So, so, so those kind of things. Right. Let me take some questions from the audience. Um, I'll, I'll, and I'll come to you next, sir. So a couple of things. One, you guys are saying some amazing things that I, that I can really appreciate. And I think um, one of the things that you were talking about, Bob? Yeah. Bob, um, it, is um, really figuring out how grassroots activity works yes. and marries itself to a political party. Yes. Right? And so yeah. around the country, these are the things that we have to figure out what are the issues going on in communities that we want people to vote for? Um, it, I think that we want people to address so that we can stand for them to vote for us. Because right. otherwise, they're not going to be voting for people who just show up, as you say, and say, hey, here's my platform, here's what I stand for. And we're like, well, what does that mean? And they, they agree. If you go through communities of color point by point on our platform and our pillars, they agree 100% almost right. across the nation. Mm -hmm. But they still don't know and they still don't vote. And so we have a lot more work to do. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to ask um, the sister next to the end was um, when you voted in 2008, there was a black woman running for president also. And so I'm curious to know if when you saw your ballot, if you noticed her name on the ballot, even though even with Barack Obama being on the ballot, and what do you think it would take for us to make sure that communities know about our candidacy? Because if you just learned about us last year, and it was a black woman on the ballot you voted on in 2008. For me, that's not a problem with you, it's a problem with us. And so what do we need to do to enhance that mm -hmm. in your community? So, that so, so really quickly, I didn't read the ballot. I went and I pressed the button for Obama and I left. <laughs> and I'm just being honest with you. I'm not, I've never been into politics. I grew up listening to uh, my father curse out Nixon and Carter. I didn't even know who the hell Nixon and Carter were. <laughs> I was too young to process his anger and his experience. I, I, I'm a Reagan baby and everything after that because I was born in the 70s. So I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say I don't know a lot about politics. I don't read the ballots when they send them to my home. These are things that I've just started reading about and educating myself about now. Um, I've seen a lot of stuff on social media about Seth and about the candidates that are currently running now. So I'm, I'm currently reading about who's running now. So this time when I go to the ballot, I'm actually voting for somebody that I know a little bit about, mm -hmm. even if I haven't met them personally. It's just never been something I've been interested in. And I don't think I'm just speaking for myself. I'm thinking I'm, I think I'm speaking for part of my community as well. There's not a lot of trust in the political process right. with any party, not just the Green right. Party. That's, that's across the board. Like, that's number, that's, wait, that's yeah, number yeah. one. Mm -hmm. that's true. Number mm -hmm. two, the mm -hmm. la if, I, if I don't know, I'm working on my doctorate degree. If I don't know about politics, mm -hmm. I can imagine how many other people don't know about politics. Everything that I've been taught about um, the government and politics has come from a dear friend of mine who's been incarcerated now for 23 years. I'm learning things from him that I didn't, I, I just didn't know about the government in general. So I'm seeking other education to learn more about this. It's something that I need to know more about and I should know more about. I'm not ashamed to tell you that I don't. I really, I'm just honestly, part of the reason was half my life, when I became a voting age, I didn't have the right to vote for a very long time after that. But if you want to go into a community, you have to be able to gain their trust. And that is going to be very hard to do because you've had two other parties that have failed tremendously, tremendously, have put things and, and said things that they were going to do 
got in office and did the complete opposite. So it's, it's going to be very, very hard. Don't give up. Keep working on it. Consistency. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Because that's what they're going to be looking for. They're going to, look, going to be looking to see if you actually keep your word. And if you don't know, say you don't. It's okay. The same way I'm up here telling you I'm working on a doctorate degree and I know this much about our government, you need to tell those communities I don't know the answer. It's just that simple. If you don't know and you can't do it, be honest. Because it's not about what people say anymore. It's about what you're actually doing. Right. And that's what people Absolutely. are looking at, what you're actually right. doing. Okay, next question. Hi, everyone. My name is Manny from Massachusetts. And um, even before I, I was a member of the Green Party, I also have, um, I have two concerns, which are my biggest fights. The first one is mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the second one is um, the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of youngsters, you know. So um, in Massachusetts, we already, we passed a legislation on which was on um, 2016, in which we delegalized marijuana, and uh, we started, you know, with a with a ballot, uh, and then ask and you know, it became a question. So has that come into you know for New Jersey? Have they come up with you know some kind of like input? a ballot um, that people can actually make it into a question for the next elections? And also, what are you doing about the children and the education? What, what is happening uh, out there? Um, because I know there's been many problems. I don't know, Jesse was taking over a, a, a new world uh, by receivership. And I, I know that um, right now, um, uh, there is a lot of uh, questions about standardized testing. So, what are, what um, what have you been doing to make changes in those two um, situations? Well, I actually um, uh, I'm, I'm a content creator, which means I create content across different platforms. So, I create content. I write. I put a blog. I'm a producer. I produce documentaries and feature films, and I'm also a speaker. So it's interesting you mentioned education. I was uh, a producer on a documentary that's actually still in production now called The Newark Project. And they're looking at edu education reform in the city of Newark and this big debate about you know, charter schools versus public schools and you know, the whole big debate about um, you know, getting back local control and all of those things. Um, so you know, there's a debate. So the, the, my biggest concern, and I think this is what's interesting about what I'm liking about the Green Party is talking about the underserved. If you look at the website, and I, I've been looking at the website myself and looking at some of the things that they've been doing and talking about on their platforms, it's about the underserved. Now I know that I think somebody from here is from New Orleans, I think the danger that's happening in education, I'll speak for Newark in particular, is the biggest city of the state of New Jersey, is where are we gonna end up like New Orleans where every school is now a charter school? Is that, that happened in New Orleans if I'm not mistaken? That is a problem, I'm not, I don't have children, but I've been a child. I went to Hawthorne Avenue School on Hawthorne Avenue from K to seven. Then I went to finish eighth grade in Alexander Street School and graduated from Alexander Street School. I went to Bellsburg, Alexander Street School's closed. Then I went to Bellsburg High School and that school is no longer a high school, it's Ivy Street School or something like that. Then I went to Seton Hall University. So I'm very, very interested in education. Obviously I'm a professor, or rather a fire professor, but I believe in education because this is our workforce. So it, it talks about that whole training that Junius talked about. Well, we have different kinds of training now, right? We don't, we don't have, a, we don't dig ditches and things like that like we used to. So I'm concerned because as a producer, when I have to hire a student from a college who's an intern and you don't know how to use a spreadsheet and you don't know how to do some of the basic fundamentals, I asked a kid one day to go, uh, we had a production and I said, you know, go get us some breakfast and get orange juice and bagels and this. He brought back um, Sunny D. Sunny D is orange drink. It's not orange juice. Like, don't you know what orange juice is? I didn't say it, but I'm thinking, oh my God. So like some of these small things that are huge things because you're not being educated properly. So it's, it's and these are people who are gonna take care of me when I get old. So this argument about, uh, or this debate about education is very important. So I would like to see, I mean, I'm not, I can't speak on if I'm an advocate for, for or against public charter schools, but I went to public schools. Traditional public schools, I know that they say, Charter schools are public schools, but I went to a traditional public school and I turned out okay. I would like kids to go to school up the street, not 
live on Chancellor Avenue by me to go to Louise A. Spencer across town. I don't feel comfortable with that. So what can we do? We can work on making sure that North gets local control, and you know, I think Jersey City got the local control back. I think uh, Patterson has an issue. So that now the local folks, local control means local people saying what we're gonna do with our kids. And so when we get local control back and making sure somebody watches those individuals too, because sometimes there's always a little you know, issue with people in power feeling a little too powerful. But the point is, once we get local control back, and we should push for this as, you know, the Green Party should be very interested in that. I'm hoping, so I haven't seen a lot about education, but I'm hoping that's an issue. That's where we'll begin with education. The local people should know what they need. We, the state doesn't know what they need. And I always tell people a lot when I do things. When I, for me as a producer, when I, when I talk to people saying, um, you know, when I go to New York and I'm producing, they go, oh, you live in Newark? Oh my God, I heard, you know, it's so dangerous. I said, do you live in Newark? <laughs> then you need to shut the hell up. Do you, can we clap for that? So people love being a backseat driver. People love talking from the sidelines. People love speaking from the fringe. So the most important thing that I think that the Green Party speaks about, and I hope you're gonna be doing, is working from the bottom up. There are more poor people than there are middle class people, than there are rich people. So these are the people who are your voters. And I have to say this openly. I've gone to many of these places at the, at the Robert Tree Hotel for every election, you know, from Corzine to McGreevy to all these, you know, governors that ran. I didn't go to, you know, any of the other governors, but I went to some of those events as a media person shooting it. Every single time I've heard them talk, they love to say, we're going to be working for the middle class, and we're going to be for the middle class, and we're going to work for the middle class. And I'm standing there like, well, most of us around here public. <laughs> you know, poor, we say poor, you know, my family's from the South. So like, I felt insulted. I felt insulted. So if you really don't want to disenfranchise the disenfranchised, that's where your big win's gonna happen. That's a win because you still gotta run, it's still politics. Work on that so we can fix our education, we can fix crime, we can fix drug addiction, um, and we can, and, and listen, it's not always about bad things. We can also keep the things that are wonderful happening, continuing to happen, um, we won't have these kinds of issues because we have people working from the bottom up. Because people at the bottom know what's happening at the bottom. Everybody up there is pontificating about what's happening down there. Y'all ain't down there. We all down there. Can I talk about that? that. Well, we had, we had, I could, this man, this is your memory. He, he didn't yeah. speak yet. Well, yeah. he has the microphone. He was, yeah, yeah. thank you. I, I got a big mouth. Oh. All right. And I, I'm from Milwaukee. Oh. In all of our cities. We got the same problem. Absolutely. But at the same time, people need to understand, and I'm proud to be a member of the Green Party, because our platform is against privatization of schools. In my town, we have worked against charter and voucher schools for the last 17 years. And in that process, we have integrated more into our black community and brought members of school board, elected members of school board, had members of school board run for, run, run for assistant deputy governor in the state of Wisconsin. So all that you're saying, it's on the real side, but at the same time, we as Greens know and understand this. A lot of this isn't new. Mm -hmm. We decriminalized marijuana in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. and we helped lead that. We're doing it in other cities in Wisconsin. And so what we need to do throughout this process is continue to carry that message and also mm -hmm. yes. integrate the social movements and these yes. issues. I'm very proud of our platform yes. because a lot of what you're talking about, we've been there. Yes. And we still go there. So I need to, need to let that be understood. Oh, yes. And also that's the position of many of us as we go forward as Greens, because we are from the bottom up. Thank and you. And now, I want to say this, and, that, and actually it's funny because when I first remember seeing it has been the Green Party. I didn't know anything about the Green Party either. I'm like, oh, y'all down here talking to us, and oh, who is this? So like, that's my point. I've not ever seen it until yeah. the Green Party. So, well, you know, and, yeah. and, and the point was brought up in terms yeah. of, of knowing things, you know, and why you don't know us. It has to do with the media. Of course. It has to do with barriers. Yeah. And those yeah. are things that we work they against. They don't want us to know. You know, you know mm -hmm. but, but that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to do with the banks. It mm -hmm. has to do with our candidates getting in the paper as much as other people. Mm -hmm. Those are barriers that as a party, we work against. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nick. Yes. Nick, Nick has a question. Yeah. yeah. Daryl and uh, George, 
and you guys that asked a question over there that I don't know. George just uh, articulated better than I could. Now, I live in Hawaii, but I lived, some of you might have heard of Fort Lee. I lived there from kindergarten through seventh grade. So originally from Fort Lee in Brooklyn. And George just articulated, because I sit as a green for years, 25 years. It's a two-way street. You guys were so passionate in talking, and I got so motivated, all three of you. And then when I heard the questions, and you don't vote, and you're just finding out, it's a two-way street. I can't. Well, wait, hold up. No, hold I want to. I want to. I, no, no, I want to finish. You'll have no, a chance. You. You'll have a chance to. I want to finish this, and then you've got to talk. And I'll put this down because George just articulated. I couldn't do it. That's why I've always been uh, amazed watching you for years. That's the point. Some of us have been working our tails off for years, and then if we had a uh, in New Jersey a green governor and a, a majority yes. green legislature, everything you talked about would be, would be those prisons would be closed already. Exactly. But people don't vote for us. We're exactly. a political party. There's also social movements, and it's a two-way street. So, um, so when I hear it's a you know. Anyway, there's nothing else I want to say. I want to listen to you guys respond because I'm not. I'm, I don't mean to be uh, criticizing you. I just realize how. Yeah, the media, and I see that in Hawaii, mm -hmm. all run by Democrats. And everyone says, "Oh yeah, let's vote for Obama because he's a Democrat." And what did he do for us? But yeah, if there was a green president or green governors or green Congress people or green uh, legislators, these things would be already in in, in effect. And we need the two way. We need the people working at the grassroots to support the Green Party. And I know where our platform is. And every single thing you talked about is in our platform. But nobody covers it and nobody uh, uh, votes for us. So anyway, and I don't mean if I misunderstood, I'm not picking on you guys at all. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. You know, what, what I hear is your passion about your party. And I understand yeah, that and I respect it. Because I was very passionate when I went and voted in my first presidential election. Not because that was a choice, I didn't have a choice. And that's what I just want to point out to you. I couldn't vote because I didn't have the right to vote. It's not that I just decided not that I just decided not to vote. I didn't have the right to vote. So my my thing that I want to say, I guess, to the Green Party collectively is that the more I learn about you and the work that you're doing, that will be helpful to me going forward in the decisions that I make. Like I said, I'm not a fan of, of any party. So it's not like I'm saying I don't like the Green Party. I'm just not a fan of politics in general. It's never been on my radar, and I'm not ashamed to say that. I speak for many, many people in my community who probably outside of their local election for the mayor, they probably are just as, as ignorant, for lack of a better word, as I am. That's the word. There's a, there's a lot of education that needs to be done, so maybe that's something that you can continue to do. You don't have to wait for mainstream media to educate people about your party and what their concerns are. Excuse me, let me interject. Uh, both you, Nick George, Jennifer, all have great points. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I like to do is kind of through my experience is um, Newark, I'm, in one sense is a different animal, but in another sense, you'll find Norks all over the country, right? right. And um, right. I lean towards the fact that in Newark, people live and sleep in Penn Station, right? And, and, and I'm sure this is not the only city that has it, but that person who sleeps in Penn Station don't care who is in office. You understand what I'm saying? Because they, the bigger fish to they, yeah, be, because <laughs> the, they were they were sleeping in Penn Station when Obama was the president, when Christie was the governor, when Christie Whitman was the governor, when McGreevy was the governor, and they're quite sure that they're going to be sleeping in there, Corazon and every other politician. So it was alluded to before about how there's just no faith, right, in politics, right. because the truth is the government and politics have always worked adversely to black people, and these are black cities. And not just black, marginalized, let's talk about marginalized people in general. LGBT right. communities, clap for that please. Okay. Um, also, women, not just African women, women of color and women in, in, in general, clap for that. Um, of, course, of course, people of color, especially African American people. So there's many marginalized groups. Um, and if you, if you notice that for many years, I mean, people know me now, I guess I'm infamous, but I've been writing about this for years. I've been writing about the LGBT community. I've had a local talk show, I've had them on. I did a show called Prison Prevention in 19, in 2001. I've been discussing mass incarceration. 
I've done projects about education as a producer. I talk about health care issues on my show. I've talked about women's right to choose. I've been talking about these things many times, many different ways on all of my platforms. So everyone knows this. So now I think the excitement for me has been that, you know, what I'm learning about the Green Party has, you guys have been there, but now uh, we can like fold over into what you're already working on, what we already know and what we're excited about to, to say, let's move this agenda forward. Because I'm like, oh, okay, they're into what I'm into. So I do my homework. So this is nothing new for me, nothing new for you, nothing new for you on the social services side, nothing new for you. So I think that we, so we, we can't leave it just up to the Green Party to save us. We've got to partner with the Green Party. We've got to partner with the Green Party because we I'm into accountability and responsibility. You know what I'm into. Okay? So we've got to partner with the Green Party. They're already there. You know, Junior said organized. They're organized. Now we can plug in and now see what we can do. And we all have different skill sets. We all have different issues. You, I might be able to bake a pie, and you might be able to fry some chicken and, and put a little egg in the bag, a little salt and pepper, and let them go travel from, from, city, from city to city to city in Jersey. But we all have something to give to the Green Party. We just can't let the Green Party do everything and say, oh, they didn't do nothing. Oh, well, you know, they, they tried. We can't be lazy about it. We've got to plug in. So now I challenge this whole table to say, what are you going to do individually to plug into the Green Party while Seth is running for governor? that you can do to help with the with their can we talk? With their I'm gonna call it an agenda, but you know what I'm saying? Because honestly, I agree, I'm tired of all these politicians. They all start to bleed into each other to look alike. It's like one yeah, big blob. You know, girl, it's a big blob. I'm, they just look the same. So and, and Seth is kind of cute. My sister said, said Seth is cute. You know, but I mean, I joke around, but so now, so that's the challenge. I'm gonna, whenever I go somewhere, I'm gonna say, what are you gonna do with the Green Party? Right. What are you gonna do to help the Green Party? They're already there. People came, just in this room alone, people came from Hawaii and New Orleans and Detroit and all these places, and they came to Newark to talk to us. I mean, we should be ashamed if we don't help to push that, 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 that agenda that they have to help people who are underserved and marginalized. We can do something. That's all I'm going to say about that. There's been some hours. I'm going to get to you next. I really wanted to speak about the second half of yeah. what I was saying. Yeah. Um, there's been some examples oh, with the Greens. I had a question. I'm sorry. Oh, she spoke earlier. I wasn't really. I want to go back to education. Okay. Go back to education. What about education? I really don't want to that. I'm in New Orleans, and I've been an education advocate. And so um, when you talk about charter schools, um, charter schools existed before what is in existence right now. The problem is not charter schools. The problem is that they are owned by corporations. And well, it's a corporate the agenda. Right. And the prisons are owned by corporations. Right. And it's a corporate agenda. So for me, the fight is not to end charter schools. It is to end corporate charter schools. Charter schools are good. They were started so that the community would manage them. But you find no charter schools in this country right now that are managed by the community. When I, my, my first charter school that my children went to in New Orleans in 2009, I was the first parent in three years to show up to a board meeting. Mm -hmm. So that is the point that I want to make, is that the problem, and this is why we don't win, the problem is not charter schools. The problem is who is running them. It is not to end the charter schools. It is to be control of the charter schools, and that's what I wanted to say. I'm well, sorry, I, hate to, I hate to jump in, but I would like to say this. I get her point, but it's like saying the problem isn't hell, it's the devil in hell. So, yeah, I can't win no, the devil's the case in hell, but no, but I'm no, trying to. I'm, I'm trying to, telling you. Yeah, but, that, but, but you can't one, win the One, one person at a time, please. One person at a time. Thing is, my thing is, if you want to win a case in hell, and the devil is the one that's running hell, you're not gonna win the case in hell. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I don't know how they started. I'm kind of like not that knowledgeable, but I know that I don't know of any charter schools now that the model isn't run by corporations. So I don't know how to separate that sister, but if we could do it, I'm open for it, but I can't see that happening. So I'm thinking we should also, I'm not saying get rid of them, make sure we preserve 
traditional public schools run by the board. That means those board members who are coming from the community is your boss. If I'm on the board, I'm the boss of the superintendent. If I'm on the board, I'm, a, I'm the boss of all the principals. If I'm on the board, I'm the boss of voting for contracts and making sure <coughs> people uh, of color and women get contracts. I'm the boss. These, these charter schools don't have that. They don't even have to teach. I've seen people have students that come from charter schools that they're not even ready for college, okay? So like, I don't know how to fix that, but one thing I do know, we can still preserve traditional public schools, and I'm not saying kick out the charters, but I don't believe in getting rid of traditional public schools. That's a no-no, period. So you don't know any traditional public schools? No, I'm saying, I'm saying in North New Jersey right now, that's the danger we're in. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have any, we have private schools, there's all kinds of schools. I'm just saying make sure we preserve the, the, the traditional public schools run by the traditional poor. What I'm saying is no traditional no, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that they should, I came from North Public Schools, sweetie. I'm, I'm doing okay, I'm saying to you, if the, if the charter schools are so, so called good, initially they were supposed to be the model for what we should be doing in the public schools. They could be the model. I see models all the time for my career. Oh, I like how Oprah does that, I'm gonna do it. Does that mean I should die? Because it's one Oprah? So I'm not saying that you shouldn't fix what's happening, but you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. They can be fixed, but they're abandoning the tr traditional public schools for the charter, and the charters are failing. The fact is, most charters fail. That's a fact. So that's all propaganda. So They're I not all successful. I think I'm going to interrupt because I'm not. I'm, I think we were challenged to ask how we can support the Green Party. So I would like. To, oh yes, that was my. I point. think I would like to be. <laughs> and honestly speaking, yes. I never really got to kind of make this point. Like we didn't come over the water right but, but you know what? That's fine because I'm, I'm one of free expression. Okay. I would just like to make a couple quick examples yep. because yep. Of, of back to that point of the Green Party. Um, two small examples, but I think they're effective models specific to North. I remember during the presidential campaign, um, we had an event, right? Seth spoke, I spoke, with some people that spoke. And there was a ton of food left over. And nobody really knew what to do with the food. What should we do with it? We loaded up, right Diane? <laughs> we loaded up. And we took it at Uckman, and we took a trip downtown Newark, and we handed out the food. Right now, that's a that's a pretty small act. That's something I've done mm -hmm. not just that time, first time, and any opportunity that I get, I'm gonna do that. But what I'm saying is that those are the type of acts you have. To, I, I don't know about every other state, but I know when if you're talking about the Green Party being effective in Newark, you have to go to the streets. And I've been to the streets. Um, Nate, Nate will tell you, we were on some of the toughest streets in Newark with Seth. And a funny story is, I'm gonna keep it short, but there were streets that I was kind of hesitant in going down. And then I turned around, where's Seth going? He was in the middle of all these people that people cast away. People, these are people on Hawthorne Avenue. People get murdered on this block regularly. That's common. Seth was in the middle of eight or nine uh, brothers that were out there, but when they got to hear what he had to say, they were celebrating. They were like, right. legalize, what, man, I vote for you, who are you? <laughs> so my point, <laughs> and, and, that, and I'm not exaggerating one bit. There are people in this room that were That's there funny. with us. He, we went to uh, uh, Hawthorne Avenue, whatever uh, blocks did we go to? We went, we went to Orange. We were at the, the Orange, we were at right. the, the park in, uh, in That was Orange Park. Oh, yeah. I am bad. Yeah, we, but listen, my point is, go to the streets. Right. Get out of politics. The biggest selling point when right. we were walking up right. on people, saying, yep. the biggest selling point when we were walking up on people because they already had a weary eye. Like, right. And, oh, I'm not a politician. Right. <laughs> I'm a pastor. Right. And then they would listen and went over. So if you want to be effective as a party, go to the streets, right. do the work, and yep. the rest will follow. That's the only point yeah. I wanted to make. I'm sorry, man, for the okay. okay. So I'll one second because she's waiting for a minute to do that, okay? Yeah. Okay, that's uh, all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank the Black Caucus for organizing. Yes, very nice. Thank you so 
wonderful dialogue that has this mm -hmm. deepened and continued. Mm -hmm. And what I'm concerned about is what Junius was trying to talk about, Junius Williams, yes. that fine intellectual, connecting the 60s experience with right. the young people who are coming out today. Mm -hmm. We have a disadvantage because there's been 30, 40 years between that experience and what we have going on today when there is a rise in movement. Mm -hmm. And usually radicalizations come every 20 years. Mm -hmm. We skipped one. Mm -hmm. We skipped one, I think, and I believe, because of neoliberalism mm -hmm. and because of the media. Mm -hmm. The media is 24-7. It wasn't that way in the 60s. Right. You had an hour or two of the media in the evening. Mm -hmm. Now people are saturated with this 1% propaganda 24-7, month in, month out, and they don't get to hear the Green Party right. in the debates <coughs> or ever, mm -hmm. ever. We're blacked out. So we have to go around Jill did a wonderful example in using the internet this time. That reached out to a lot of people. <coughs> but connecting with the 60s experience, for one thing, on the uh, charter schools, the key thing is that the privatization is a profit motive. Thank you. They're making money yes. in the charter schools. Yes. That's the issue, yeah. and that's the, that's the difference with public education. Exactly. That where it is paid by the taxpayer, and it's non-profit. Exactly. And they want to privatize everything. Mm -hmm. But connecting, with, now in the Green Party, we have a layer of vets that have been in the struggle for 50 years. We're dying out. Mm. We've got to pass these lessons mm -hmm. on. Those four points that Junius made are key. Coalition mm -hmm. was a main thing. The Green Party doesn't do enough coalition work. We've got to do more coalition work. Get into the communities and build coalitions. Oh, that's true. Very important. And transmit the knowledge. For instance, if you look at the program of the Black Panther Party, it says it all. Read the 10 points. They were weak on women that needed to be strengthened. Also, the program of the National Black Independent Political Party. The Green Party needs to adopt all those demands. Just take a real have to read We should incorporate those into our program immediately. And one of the key things was black control of the black community. That was the key thing that relates to education. And whether it's the Latino community, our community, education, community control. So these are the things that I think can happen at this convention that we're having. And it has to happen day in and day out. But I want to just say to, to whites, when you go into different people of color communities. You go in not to teach, but to learn. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. This is a big problem on the left. That people go in and they think they're going to teach, and you're in there for years to learn. So yes. We, we Thank you. Yes. What is your name here? Absolutely. Linda. Yes. Linda. Linda. That was good, Linda. Gentleman right here with the hat, yeah, he was here. He has a question. I know he's been standing up. Does he have something to say? Yes. Okay. I expected that there would be a discussion of reparations sometime this evening, and I would like to see a serious discussion of reparations. Oh. It seems to be something that people have forgotten about. Oh. That the Green Party has a strong position on, and that it's something where I have some. Walker, something where I have a lot to learn. What happens to the Oh, well, let's get into it. Yeah. Please. On a 
couple subjects. One in terms of homelessness. We don't have to separate it, we just have to do it. Right. And identify as screens. I've worked in our homeless community for 28 years now. You know, and, and as Greens, we go into shelters and we cook food. As Greens, we make sure that those shelters, that people can use that as an address and help them register as votes, to register to vote. As Greens, we provide transportation to homeless people on voting day and get them there and get them back. You can do it, you can do it. In terms of reparations, I'm so proud. And I talk about our platform. 2003, the Green Party Black Talk Caucus introduced uh, institutional reparations within COBRA and they, and they passed unanimously into our, into our platform 14 years ago. And many of us still work, 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 work in that vein, especially in Michigan. So what I'm saying is that we all understand and we appreciate what you're talking about, but we need to share, mm -hmm. we need to share how to do things mm -hmm. because it's the right thing to do. And you're saying the right thing and we're doing the right thing, but we need to do more of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I, I have a question. Um, okay. You have a question? Over here. Sir? No. Yeah. Yes. Don't say, don't say take the mic. He's had his hand out. First off, I, was, I want to say that I was very happy to see Ms. Steinbach him because I was very proud to vote for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. My name is Ben from Milwaukee, same as uh, Mr. Martin there. And you know, I've been listening and I came here because um, I guess I would have always considered myself a Democrat. Like a lot of people, maybe not some of the veterans who are in the party who've been doing this for a while, but I'm a teacher in Milwaukee, I'm a special education teacher in a public high school. And um, anyways, when I'm thinking, of, when I hear you saying, what can we do to reach out to people? And I totally agree that the Democratic Party, and of course the Republican Party, has totally ignored you know, the African American community in, in, this, in this country, completely. I mean, you see what they're doing, they're investing money in prisons, they are taking money out of communities, they're you know, redlining whole cities and everything. I mean, so when we talk about what we need to do, I think we need to make sure that people who consider themselves Democrats, who are white, Hispanic, black, whatever, that the issues the Green Party wants to be, have addressed are all their issues too. Right. Because now the middle class is seeing their wages eroded. They're wondering, wow, what's happening here? I mean, it's all coming down on everybody now. So, you know, people who would not concern themselves disenfranchised at all, they're starting to get disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. So I think the Green Party too, we need to reach out to people, as people have said, but we need to make people understand that consider themselves Democrats, or even maybe some Republicans, mm -hmm. that the, the, the needs they have these should start to be their issues too. Mm -hmm. It's going to start to affect them too now. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't already. And that's why I was saying that. Oh, that's good. I think, Linda, I think Linda said it best. When you go into communities, you're not there to teach, you're there right. to learn. That's true. So I think part of the problem is, is that everybody wants to be an, an authority on something. Mm -hmm. How about people just start with being human mm -hmm. and showing people your humanity? And if you just so happen to be a part of the Green Party, mm -hmm. then hey, you're, you're um, you have increased <laughs> by a, another hundred percent. I, I think we spend too much time looking at um, the the Democrats, the Republicans, the Green Party. It doesn't matter what party you are. If you're ineffective in in helping mm -hmm. people address their concerns, it's not going to matter what your party is. I, I think maybe we should go back to the aspect of, of humanity because we've lost a lot of that with the way that we treat people and the way that people are still marginalized and still have to suffer and endure poverty and things of that nature. There's too much of leading, like Bob um, talked about earlier. The, the lead, the message, and this could just be unintentional. This could just be your passion about your party being spoken about. But you have to look at how that message is being received to the people that you're talking to. It's the party first and then the people's concerns second. And you have to reverse that so that people can hear you and listen. We, we all receive information differently. It's not this is the Green Party, vote for us, and then we will close the prison. You need to reverse that and learn to talk to people. And I'm saying that because I'm not a politician. I will never be a politician. So I don't have the right slogan to give to you to make everybody clap and yell for me. You just want to get pure, unadulterated me. <laughs> you, you have to understand how your message is being received. 
People aren't hearing you because you have to reverse the message. It's Green Party first, vote for me and I'll do this for you. You have to start from the bottom of that and work your way up. Your party affiliation is known. Nobody can take it from you. So stop leading with that. Lead with what you're going to do and give some results. And everything else will fall into place. And I'm just giving you this just based on my life experience. Many of you in here are old enough to be my parents. Some of you could be my grandparents. I respect those that came before me. But in terms of getting that back, some of those generations don't honor us. They skip over my generation and go immediately to the children. How do you think that makes us feel? We have something to contribute to. You're not going you, and my point in this is that not one person can get all of this stuff done. Not one party can get all of it done. It's going to take every fucking able body to change the things that we're talking about. I apologize for cursing, but that's just my frustration. I, I think people miss that. It's going to take everybody. These aren't problems that two or three people could fix. We need every single able body to fix the things that are wrong in our communities and our society. All right. We, we to, all right, this is going to be the last question on this topic. We're going to move on to uh, the, the topic of reparations. Thank you. Um, it's actually just a couple of comments. One of them, our friend um, George Michael? Martin, sorry. George <laughs> <Just> Michael? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, made, made a comment before, before me, so I think you can, because you're talking about bringing food to the community, a community. I was, uh, I was thinking in my head, did you bring voter registration to? Because I think that, uh, I'm, I guess my comments are more out of frustration of trying to deal with the party. In my neighborhood, that's, that's working more in an educational and inspirational level, which is very important too. But we are a political party, and, and I'm trying to see this as a, in a more pragmatic way. So, bringing the voter registration every time you're gonna reach out and, and knock on everybody's doors and reaching out to the communities because uh, talking about it on the internet for folks that can't afford the time to sit on the internet, it, it's kind of preaching to the choir. And it's great to be talking among ourselves right. about how, uh, the values, and it's all beautiful. We all get it. We don't need to right. keep inspiring ourselves, I guess. But uh, just, I guess my main pragmatic point is that um, I, I would have loved to have a workshop to offer, but my suggestion to deal with the media problem is uh, I would imagine that every cable, satellite, or any local station has a public access channel. And what we did, what I have been doing, uh, I mean, you don't need a high, you know, nothing fancy production. It could even be with a cell phone, as long as you can burn a DVD, that, but in, in every location is different, but they usually have a part of the franchise. Every resident has the right to go and, and sign up for an hour a week of TV time, and a lot of people who don't have internet and nothing, they have basic cable TV, they're gonna watch your face there once a week. If you don't bring anything new next week, it's just gonna keep repeating. So you can, uh, last year I actually brought, um, um, Jill Stein uh, answering the debate questions um, and, and put myself on the back there, tail end, talking about our local group and it, that was repeating for months. So sometimes, uh, and, and there are people who all of a sudden, oh, I saw you on TV. So you're spreading the message, you're dropping a little, you know, can't, I, I don't know, it, this could be a drop in a bucket, but it's, Something public access channels, I, I think, uh, uh, is a tool that we don't utilize mm -hmm. um, enough. Mm -hmm. So, thank you, great work. Thank you, thank you. Um, and just as a final note, I think um, George, if there's if there's any models that's been successful in other geographical locations, there should be a method that we we share that with with, with you know uh, people that are involved with uh, the politics of Brooklyn here in New Jersey, you know, because different parts of the planet, you know, you might have more success over there, you know, so if there's some method in which it can be shared. Right, right. Um, reparations, one more, you want to get, I got you. You mentioned, you mentioned, uh, we, we make a lot of mistakes, but there are some things we're learning from what you said. Um, so I just want to mention that tonight, we're putting, uh, you mentioned Khalid Browder, tonight we're putting Akeem Browder, uh, his brother, 
who founded uh, the campaign of Shutdown Records, he's, he's, he's going to be the mayoral candidate for the Green Party in New York City. Oh, nice. Okay? Oh, nice. And we're also working, we have a bunch of other candidates, including um, uh, someone who's going to be a Green, but he can't run as a Green this year. But he's going to be uh, running as an independent. So um, Anthony Beckford, who founded the Cop Watch in his neighborhood, is going to be running for the city council. And he's going to be running not on the Green Party ballot line, but visibly as a Green. So uh, those are two examples of doing the kind of things I think that you were talking about. Right, exactly. Bring the community to the party. And Thank you. Uh, like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, as far as the discussion of reparations, um, my, you know, my, I think anybody who has a serious reading of history understands that this nation was built on the labor of slaves. Um, that's a, a pretty simple uh, topic right there. Um, these uh, institutions have all benefited uh, many of the major corporations uh, that uh, helped establish this nation, where I'm built with uh, the money, the free labor, the money from slaves, a lot of the laws that were written intentionally excluded black people from participating uh, in, in many of the laws. I don't claim uh, to be an expert on it, but to me it's not really a complex issue. It's a plain as day. There have uh, been other reparations awarded to several other nations um, in much less egregious circumstances. So I'll open the floor up for people that would like to discuss uh, the issue of reparations, how we can move that agenda forward Anybody on the panel would like to address that? Um, I think it means different things to different generations. That's what I find interesting about the topic of reparations. For my generation and talking to my peers about the topic, um, it's a difficult discussion because they don't want to acknowledge the things that have happened. Um, sort of living in the moment and just trying to move forward. Um, when I talk to elder people and those that came before me, um, there's a lot more dialogue. Um, the dialogue is more concrete and specific. So that's a topic that I'm learning um, more about. But I just find it interesting that based on who you're talking to, the response, the response that you get differs significantly. Um, I think that anything that could be done to atone for what has happened to us um, is definitely needed and we should receive it. I'm not an expert on that topic and I'm not gonna um, pretend to be, but it's, it's, I, believe, I really believe it means different things to different generations of black people. And you know, there's been a lot of discussion about how the reparation is gonna take place, you know, you know, in what way, in what vein, in what manner. You know, so uh, the, the initial reparation was, you know, 40 acres and a mule, just hand every slave member 40 acres and a mule. So I mean, there's this huge debate about well, you can't give black folks 40 acres of mule because you know Lisa wasn't a slave, and how do we know she was a slave, and how do we know her grandmother, her forefathers, and foremothers were slaves? So like it, all this conversation. So I mean, it can reparations can happen um, in creative ways that can go back to something kind of Junius said in terms of like they have these programs and these opportunities, and even like free college and universities for. Not just people of color, but just people, you know, New York has it now. So I mean, there's many ways to start the ball rolling on how this, what this reparation would look like, but it's something that should be a conversation. It should be on the agenda. It should be on the agenda, serious, hot and heavy. And we should be talking about how, we, how can we craft this, 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 the way in which it's going to happen. Because if we keep ignoring it, like she said, the next generation, it gets weaker. The discussion gets weaker. Like your generation is a little weaker. Even my generation, I'm not that much younger than her. I mean, older, older than her, a little older. Um, but um, so, because my mother talked about it, so we don't want it to get weakened. So I think, uh, again, plugging into, you know, in our, you know, the Green Party, because I, I don't think the Republicans and the Democrats are even thinking about that, because I think President Clinton just said, I apologize for slavery. Like, really, dude? I think, that, I think did, we, did he do that once we he apologized for slavery? Like, I don't want to hear your apology. We need reparation. So like, that was cute, but it was not, was not cute. So I think, I think giving people an option um, other than just the two parties, to me, is exciting because it now shakes everything up. And I, I want to just say this, I, I do agree with her about it can't only just be about pulling a lever. But we got to pull that lever. 
We we gotta know it's we gotta know to elect is to get you know legislation passed. It's about that legislation too. So I don't want to abandon one for the other, right? We can you know be a little political. You gotta vote, you know. But we gotta keep that grassroots thing happening so we can marry those things so that like she said, it doesn't get to be extreme. You're running up in people's you know coffee clashes and you you go into these groups and organizations and you're just talking about vote for me and you've got this like these invisible pom poms going. It, there should be a real sincerity to what you're trying to do because after that vote, if you're not elected, are you still gonna keep it going? That's the big concern she's talking about. So that's where we're disenfranchised. So the Green Party seems like whether there's a vote or not, it's happening. So you're running for office, great. If you win or you lose, your agenda does not change. That's what we're looking for. And I'm thinking this is what the Green Party is trying to show that with or without being elected, we're here. That's what I'm guessing. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't run for public office because it's important that people like people in the Green Party are running for public office with sick of these other figureheads and these rubber stamps. That's my take on it. I also want to add one thing really quickly. Um, there is, and I guess this will fall under reparations, which is why I want to discuss it and also we forgot to mention it earlier. Um, there is a group in North Carolina, they're called um, the I Am We Prison Advocacy Network. And current, currently they are sponsoring um, the Millions for Prisoners Human Rights March, which is going to take place on August the 19th in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, they are seeking, and I'm summarizing here, they are seeking um, to change the 13th Amendment and have the slavery clause removed from the 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, they, are, they are seeking a constitutional convention. Please do not get angry if I'm not saying this correctly. I've said many times before I'm not a political person, so I may not be, be expressing all of these things correctly. But what I can do before I leave here this evening, I have some information about the march and the, and the group that is sponsoring the march. Um, the idea of the march came from prisoners on the inside themselves. So I think that is very um, commendable for people to still be able and willing to organize and try to make some change happen despite them being in very, very compromised conditions. So I am um, supporting the march as much as I can from where I sit here in New Jersey. Um, if you are from New Jersey, there will be buses leaving from Trenton and North to go to the march on August the 19th. There's probably a bus leaving from most major cities, but I'll give you all the information about um, the bus information, about the IMWE Prison Advocacy Network, they're, they are going to need all of the support and help that they can get to move their agenda forward. So I think that the Green Party, as well as every other party, could get involved in that and help with that. It's a grassroots effort. So is and this is my first time ever joining something of this magnitude, despite my big mouth and all the other things that I'm passionate about. I've never ever um, involved myself in anything that talked about changing part of the Constitution. So for me, this is a really uh, big learning experience. I'm learning a lot about different areas of the world that I didn't go to before. I'm meeting people that I didn't interact with before. And I'm also learning more about myself. So if you can support the march in any way, that would be great. There is a fundraiser for the march itself. There's also a fundraiser for the state of New Jersey. If you can't make it, consider purchasing a ticket for a family or for someone else um, to be able to go. I'd like to uh, just start briefly on, on uh, reparations, uh, something like a New Jersey approach um, that we can take a look at what's happening with the shifts among uh, the, to take a New Jersey break it down of what's happening with the poverty rate and with the, the loss of health care and the, all the losses that the people are suffering. And at the same time, uh, show how the, the funds are being shifted to the military budget and being shifted to tax break for the rich. Because everyone says, oh, where are we going to come up with the money for reparations? Well, we can show that right now we have reverse reparations because right now the super oppressed are being more put upon. So, so I think we can, t we can analyze New Jersey or wherever we're organizing. Um, and, and put out the fact sheet. Here's, here's what's really happening. Here's, here's the, all the program, all the food programs being cut, 
The, this many millions of dollars coming out of Newark, this many million dollars coming out of Trenton, or wherever state you're in, and, and, and lay it all out and say, and that's why we need reparations, because, because, repar because right now, this is what's killing us. And, and the only way to survive is if we reverse this. And reparation, reparations is a step toward reversing all of that. That's just kind of an analysis that and, we put and it to listen, people. And the word racism is an interesting word people love to throw around. Uh, a lot of times, you know, when I was on Tucker Carlson's show speaking about uh, these issues called white privilege, you know, you have the trolls call me a racist, you know, because people are afraid of the loss of the power. They're afraid. They know I'm not a racist. People know that the word racist means you must be able to oppress a group of people. You know, I never oppressed anyone. I am a part of the oppressed. So what it's about is this reparations thing which is looming over that the thing called racism, is the loss of power. People are afraid to be us. They don't want to be us. They don't want to be black, or what that means. It's not that they don't know, I always correct people, but people don't understand, yeah, they do understand. But they don't, yeah, but they do know. They know exactly what's going on. All of the people who are the oppressors, whether it be misogyny, that's a man oppressing women, whether it be the bigger group called heterosexual oppressing homosexuals and LGBTQ, and they don't want them to get married, and they throw Bibles at them all the time, whether it be whites oppressing blacks, they all know what it is. And nobody wants to be the oppressed. That's the reason. If we all could just be okay, and we could live equally, then that's fine, but nobody wants to live equally. They want to oppress. So somebody said earlier, this young lady said, what can we do as African Americans and, and Latinos to you know, help. Here's my thing, I'm gonna say something very dumb and very simplistic, and, and you know, white folks kinda listen a little bit. If everybody of color in America, if every, I'm gonna say of color, because folks don't wanna be called black. I ain't black, I'm Indian. I ain't black, I'm Puerto Rican. I ain't black, I'm, uh, I'm Jamaican. I ain't black, I'm African. I ain't black. I'm black. Okay, so I'm not gonna say black. I mean, I'm black, but you know. So I'll just say, people of color. Does that feel better? If everybody, young lady, who's of color said, we're all one, we're all of color, we would not be minorities in America now, would we? Because we're not the minorities in America. But the divide of the racism is why it's being, that's the agenda being pushed, because they don't want us all to think like this, because what, what happens is in the shift of power, the racists don't want that to happen because if every person of color said we are all one people, there would be no reason to fight. It's over. We are now going to be on top. So now let's not even get into the top and bottom, right? Let's just all just say, who cares about the race? We, we see the races. Why don't we all, who are not thinking like that, who are not racist, think about just the people and everyone being able to thrive? That's what's gonna happen, and guess who's gonna have to help us do that? White people who are not racist. That's where it's gonna have to begin and happen. And when we have, and it's happened over and over again over the years through the Underground Railroad, if it weren't for uh, white folks who had helped out in that, we wouldn't be able to have gotten out of slavery, and we had marches on Washington, we saw people of other races come out and march, and the same thing with Black Lives Matter. We see lots of people of other races march and go to Ferguson and those things with Black Lives Matter. So we have to continue that, but I think at the same time, people of color have to see themselves of color and not say, well, you're black and I'm not. Like, what's all this about? We have this infighting with people of color that to me is sickening me. That's why we continue to be divided. So we need to not continue to divide ourselves and white folks who are not racist need to start to partner with us and then guess what happens? Those trolls, those racist people and those negatives, we override them. It's gonna be a mindset. It's a harder thing to change. It's not brick and mortar, it's just a mindset. So maybe we can start having panels and talking about it to start unlocking this everyday thing of I'm on my cell phone. We're not having these discussions anymore. So it, we were very much into a mindset in the 60s. There was a mindset, we were all on one accord in a mindset. That's gone. So can we reintroduce that when we're talking about panels and going into these coffee clutches and going into the streets and having these conversations about how should we be looking at this thing? That's how reparations happen. Re reparations means repair something. Repair the ills in the community. Repairing it. It's not only just the money and the programs. Sir, yes, you have a question? Yes. <laughs> Anyone else? 
He looks like Larry David. He looks like Larry David. <laughs> So that's why we need a green party. So we can start talking truth 
on these issues. Yeah. You know, not Obamacare or a tweaked version of it. No, we need health care for everybody like any other. Uh, and let me tell you something. I, I, I'm a big, I'm a big supporter of, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm a big, I'm a big supporter. I guess, I guess I can talk about a lot of topics because I've been poor and black for 53 years. So I've had bad health care and no health care. I've had bad education because, you know, I grew up in the North school systems and struggles and I went to Seton Hall University and I tested into remedial classes and cried and I got a 690 on my SAT scores and cried and I still made it through. So I can talk about a lot of these topics because my age is there, I'm good, but I'm also, and I'm still a part of those ills. And let me say this about universal health care. I don't know about single payer health care. I don't like the verbiage. I like universal health care as a verbiage. You know, health, universal health care, I don't love Michael Moore, but I, I researched beyond that. I like the model that they're doing over there in England. The model that they're doing over there, and I, I know that they're doing it in Canada as well, but I love the model there because, you know, and they say, well, who's going to pay for that? First of all, you know, universal health care there is doctors work for the government. They don't have prior practices and all of that, and they get paid bonuses for healthy patients. Guess what? If I'm healthy, I can work. If I can work, I can pay get my check and pay taxes. I'll give you a personal story. Back when I left corporate America, I was working for Kellogg Sales Company as a salesperson. I worked for Pfizer Pharmaceuticals as a salesperson. Then I worked for Bristol Myers Squibb as, as a pharmaceutical rep. And I went to school for communications. I said, what the hell am I doing writing in corporate America? So I left there to start my own business and be an entrepreneur. Well, obviously, 23 years later, I'm still struggling. But somewhere along the way, because I don't have the good health care anymore, I rolled around not having any health care because I was too poor, too rich to get the health care, and too poor to afford health care monthly. I had fibroid tumors. This is in 2001. A lot of African Americans have fibroid tumors. I'm talking like I'm bleeding like a pig. I'm talking bleeding through my clothes. I'm talking bleeding on your couch. I'm talking bleeding in the car. I'm bleeding like a pig on a daily basis. I'm in pain. I could barely work. I could barely work. And if I could not work, I could not pay my taxes because I have no money to pay taxes. So somebody said, apply for charity care. I said, what is that? So I applied for charity care and I was able to get a myomectomy. I was able to get a surgery that removed my fibroid tumors. It's only a one year thing, your charity care is one year, but I was able to get that surgery over 13 years ago. And the only reason why I'm sitting here now is because I was able to get that surgery. And for 13 years, I was able to work. For 13 years, I was able to pay my taxes. For 13 years, I was able to produce documentaries. It made me be, my good health made me be able to work. So I, how dare somebody say, who's gonna pay for that? Who's gonna pay for that? We're gonna pay for that. So, you, so I wish I had universal health care now where I could do prevention. So these doctors get paid bonuses for healthy patients. And that's where the money's made. They're acting like there's gonna be some deprivation because the taxpayers are paying for it. Healthcare. Well, we pay for the roads, don't we? We pay for many things out of our taxes. So I'm all for, I guess they call it single payer, single payer healthcare or universal healthcare. I need to see something more than what's happening now because I am a recipient of something like a charity care. And because of that, that's why I was able to work. I was literally physically not able to work without being healthy. It's important. That's it. Right. This, thank you. I mean, it's a real thing. Is, is there anyone else um, who would like to, to comment on uh, reparations? I don't want to move on to the next topic without, I, I would like to know, um, my, my two points on this, I would really like to know, be more familiar with um, where the Green Party is at okay. in regard to pushing that issue forward and making that realistic. But just as a, another issue, um, you know, people, those who know me know that I'm, I'm I uh, have some pretty, uh, I guess you could say, radical views. Um, I don't consider them radical. Um, I consider them measurable in, um, in relation to the seriousness of the situations. But I'm speaking about, um, I'm not a big person on reform. I don't think uh, many of these issues can be resolved through, uh, Jennifer alluded to uh, something that was similar to my mentality through legislation. You know, I've seen um, some of the worst conditions 
in society and outside of society. I've seen and I've been, you know, a part of it. I, I was, you know, a, a product of uh, making knuckleheads. Is what mm -hmm. I call it. That's mm -hmm. what they do, and it is self-serving because it drops your cards. We're eaten up by the prison system, and I've seen how they treat. I've been treated uh, worse than a dog. Treated worse, you know, and fed things that that nobody in here would even consider eating, right? So those type of views kind of shape my mentality. I'm like, so when a lot of these, if there were laws against these things, I know that they wouldn't be enforced because I've seen and experienced the people who take a thrill and 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 just destroying me in every way that they come, they could. So. You know, a lot, I would like to know what some of the actions of the Green Party are to make these things real, because a lot of this stuff is not going to get done legislatively. Like land, they're not giving up no land. Yeah, well, now, I, I just be like, I wouldn't be true to myself if I didn't just say that directly. Me knowing that, me understanding the depths of the evils of this society, and me say, well, act like there's some way that that could be negotiated. That's not going to happen. So we should capitulate to imperialism. I mean, <laughs> I don't think that, no, hold on, no. Let me give you the direct answer on that. I was thinking of something else, but no, I mean, absolutely not. You shouldn't capitulate. I'm a fighter. I did tell you I served 23 years in prison, right? And I was not affected by being inside 23 years. I wasn't institutionalized. I continued to fight. I was put under the prisons, literally. <laughs> All right? So well, I'm just saying that. That's not something that I wear as a badge of honor. But I did draw strength and resilience from that. So as far as compared to imperialism, I don't even understand that language. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, all right, and I don't think anybody is along the lines, but I just want to be, I wouldn't be fair to myself, right? I wouldn't be doing you guys justice if I didn't, like, uh, kind of push us to look at things from a very realistic perspective. A lot of things, and I know there's a lot of people here that have faith in politics, and the Green Party being an alternative to what's offered is it's a slippery slope that we understand that, you know, it's still a system, you know, and, you know, this this is a nation of, of people that murder people, that have murdered people. I mean, let's just be real about the situation. And I'm not saying anybody is here is under the threat of being murdered, I'm saying that you're not. But that's not the point that I'm making. I mean, understand what you, I, all of us are up against. And people that know me know that um, these uh, realities are, are near and dear to me. So just with that being said, you have a question? Or a like, comment, I'm sorry? Did you get a mic? Oh, oh, I didn't know she was there. Oh, he's there. I just want to say that uh, my name is Steven Burchinski. I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I mean, I'm a Green Party member right now, but this time last year, I was walking in from D.C. up to Philadelphia uh, for the March for Democracy and then being there for Senator Bernie Sanders at the DNC. It's kind of like, I can't believe that this happened all in basically one year. Uh, but that said, I'm listening carefully. It's been since 1989 since you've had the, the bill up for reparations. And so, and which party was in power at that time, coming up in 1989? Which, which one's been in power for a long period of time? It's been there for, done that, and you haven't got a t-shirt even to show for it. So at this point, however, we have much greater issues to go ahead and look at. The survival of the planet is the biggest one for all of us that we're facing right now. The scientists are saying right now that even the three degrees Celsius temperature change will lose 18% of our wheat crop. Syria and the imperialism that's happened out there have all been issues with regards to our changing the overall life support for the planet. So everything else right now, yes, we do need love, we do need the colonization at all levels, uh, but until we all say that we need to work together on bigger issues, right. we're not even going to get to the smaller ones of how do we address what we did historically. Yeah. And now that's come from a state where we have we have indigenous people, uh, the Pueblos have been traumatized for years, the land grants that can, did come in from the time period of the Spaniards also want restitution. Mm -hmm. um, 
everybody wants restitution, but the other thing is, is we all got to go to work on something that's much greater than yeah. ourselves. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's like Lake Mary here, right here. Uh, those are the oh. oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, then I guess she'll be next. The question about what we're doing with reparations. Exactly. That uh, I wanted to answer that a little bit as um, a co-chair of the Green Party of the United States and um, one of the steering committee co-chairs now. I'm not answering uh, per se for the Green Party, but what I can tell you is what I perceive what's going on. Um, the Green Party of the United States, although we have that platform, we, have not, we don't have much progress in that area. And I would say that the reason is, is because we're dealing with systemic issues as this um, man on the corner, I'm Bob. sorry, Bob, as Bob had said. Some systemic issues that are really um, entrenched, right, that we have to work together collectively um, to dismantle. And um, one of the things that I would say, for example, and I want to go back to you here, um, is the perception of race, right, and how mm -hmm. we are devalued as individuals. Mm -hmm. And until we're not dealing with that issue, we're not going to have progress with reparations, exactly. right? Um, right. And so yeah. I think that that's something that we need to work on, right? Yes. Is changing that perception and valuing people like one race is a human race. Um, but again, uh, my concern um, as a party is, is that accountability is a major issue with some of these larger systems. And uh, I'm not. And, and there's accountability everywhere, right? With the government, um, with the democracy, with the failed democracy, with our educational system. But the reality is, until we come together, doesn't matter what race you are, and we're right. holding accountable these larger systems that are perpetuating these problems. We're not going to have a, any progress at all. Whether we're the Green Party, whether we're the Republican Party, whether we're the Liberation Party, it's just not going to happen. Um, and one major change for me that I think as a Green Party uh, co-chair is with the Department of Justice, right? When the Department of Justice can sit back and see lives being murdered and killed over and over again, and they're not intervening in any way, mm -hmm. and requesting that these individuals, uh, these murderers, these cops, these killer cops, are holding people accountable and prosecuting them what kind of message are we sending out to the community, right? We're saying that this behavior is okay, right? And until we begin to collectively say that it's no longer okay, and the systems that are in place are beginning to prosecute and change the system for the better, we're not gonna have any progress for reparations because they're gonna continue to justify the reasons why not to do it. Exactly. Thank you so much. Yeah. George, I have, you're going to wrap it up for us. Get to that point. Yeah, let the speaker talk. Let her go back there and let this man talk. Yeah. Let him wrap it up because we okay. won't talk a lot. Let those two talk. I would, I would like for you to wrap, to, to, to yeah. thank wrap it up. To Rachel. Okay, thanks. I'll be pretty quick. Uh, my name is Constance. I'm uh, reporting from Columbus, Ohio, and I just wanted to, um, uh, I guess, respond to that question. Uh, I would say the Ohio Greens are very supportive of black power, and that's something that we work for. We're working against the prison industrial complex, black, on Black Lives Matters, and on a lot of policing issues. So in Columbus, there is a lot, a very high rate of police brutality, and this is something that we see activists working on constantly, working on getting some type of consent decree, getting the Department of Justice in Columbus, and I think that over the past couple decades there has been um, some attempts to get a consent decree with the Columbus police, but those have not gone through, so we still continue to have the same issues with police brutality. Uh, locally in the Franklin County Green Party of Ohio, uh, they have amended the, the platform and the bylaws to declare that county central committee as an anti-racist uh, organization, and I do think that there is uh, support for reparations. I think that the issue is moving the dialogue forward. And also, since we have so many social justice issues, um, of course, inherited wealth, I think, is a lot of the issue with reparations, that most wealth in this country is inherited. And so having a, leg a legacy of slavery uh, with no reparations means that 
black people continue to live in poverty. And so we need to find ways to alleviate that poverty. I believe that that will benefit the whole population, all working people, and um, that we need to do that. We need to ensure social justice for um, our black neighbors and, um, and that that is gonna benefit everybody. But I do wanna say that in Ohio, we're very supportive of that and uh, we want to push forward a black power agenda and um, work on those policing issues specifically as well as a lot of other social justice issues. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I live in Massachusetts. I've been a member of the Green Rainbow Party of Massachusetts, the Green Party of Massachusetts, for 14 years. And um, recently, I've helped to become a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And I, I went to Florida in April. And in St. Petersburg, Florida, the Uhuru Movement has um, a candidate, Aretha Akile Canyon, running for, for city council in St. Petersburg. And, <laughs> for mayor of St. Petersburg, and I'm, I'm talking about this because it's possible for people to run for office. That's trying to demanding reparations to start right now. That these candidates, their platform is for reparations from the city of St. Petersburg for the the city of St. Petersburg to divert uh, money to um, reparations and economic development for the black community in, in St. Petersburg, and instead of like spending a lot of money on police and police containment of the black community to have economic development and housing in the black community and to have community, black community controls the police and um, you know prosecute killer cops and get rid of them and have black community policing. And also there's a um, baseball stadium in St. Petersburg that was built, I'm not sure what decade, maybe the 70s that was built by destroying a black neighborhood and building this baseball stadium. So the platform is to return that land to the, the black community. So I, I just wanted to bring this up that we can start having reparations now. There's a, um, I mean, Aretha and Jesse, I don't think they're Green Party members, but they're endorsed by the Green Party. They spoke at the, the um, Green Party State Convention there, and there's a lot of enthusiasm in the community and enthusiastic cooperation with the Green Party going on there. Thank you. And what was your name, sir? David David, thank you so much for your time. George, would you please you. Uh, share, share your... And, and I'll be quick. As an OG Black Panther, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And I know a climate and I work on that, and we won't, might not be able to breathe in 20 years, but we can get a lot done all through this passage. As the one who presented it, the reparations amendment to our national council, we haven't got too far because of a lot of other things. But you're the catalyst can make, that can help us pick this up. I invite you to join the Black Caucus for dinner on Saturday night to continue this conversation because Washington has been stuck on stupid for decades. And what's been happening in this country is local democracy. The local democracy movement is real important. And that means through resolutions, or, 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 or uh, uh, going to the polls within our communities, we can change things. So let's start this conversation Saturday night, and I also volunteer to come back and work with you during the month of August. But we can move this ahead, because reparations can be the issue to build the Green Party here in New Jersey. And we gotta find a way to do that. Whatever way it is, we gotta get together and we'll do that. So let's break red Saturday night, please. Where? Well, we'll, 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 we'll figure it out. I don't know where it's going to be, but we'll get it done. We're hungry. We're all hungry. We're going to go get it done. All right. We need our food. So thank you. Look, look, there's um, um, George Martin and, and then Mr. Morgan Ross, right? Moss. Moss. I'm sorry. Moss. Um, I just want to you know, say thank you for the, your contributions, your establishment of you know, the National uh, Caucus and traveling here, not just you two, but everybody that traveled yeah. um, these great distances to be a part. Um, I enjoyed hearing your voices. I enjoyed seeing your, uh, your faces. Uh, 
Ms. Jill Stein, thank you for coming in. Everyone else, I just want to, you know, bring it to a conclusion. But finally, I would like to just thank uh, Bob, yeah. and uh, also Lisa. Lisa, would you please, you know, just acknowledge and give them some you know, yeah. 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 If you've not signed my petition to be reinstated, just go to change.org and write reinstate Professor Lisa Durth, and you'll see the petition. Just sign the petition. You say why. Oh, I like burden. Take off the B and put the D. D U R D E N. So reinstate Professor Lisa D U R D E N and just sign a petition and tell why you feel like she get 50 it. more signatures tonight. Yes, right. absolutely. And, and, and friends and everybody, if you've been in your state, this should be a, this should, wherever you go, let them all do it. Yes. Um, Ahmed, Diane Moxie, everybody uh, that's here from the local Greens for organizing oh, this Oh, yes, event. thank you. And the peaches were delicious. I didn't do peaches. The peaches were delicious. <laughs> I had about six. <laughs> no, I think I had um, three. So, and just in closing, yeah, absolutely. Just in closing, um, Bob, Jennifer, if you'd like to share anything that you're doing um, organizationally that you'd like to share. Well, y'all know what I'm doing, so that's it. It's <laughs> out of petition. Um, September is National uh, Recovery Month, and the, the term recovery covers a lot. It just doesn't cover substance, substance use. Um, it, it covers mental health, it covers incarceration, and a lot of different other topics. Um, so I have recently, um, about a, maybe a year, a little over a year ago, I formed a nonprofit organization, and we are currently working with SAMHSA, who is our federal um, head on our substance abuse and mental health here in the United States. Um, we're working with them very um, aggressively to map out um, our plan and our services for the community. Um, this September, September 25th and 26th, there will be a two-day summit in support of Recovery Month in Atlantic City, New Jersey at the AC Sheraton. Um, I have some flyers to pass out for you. Um, it is a paid event. The cost to attend for the two total days is $40. Um, but there's also a scholarship that you could apply for that would allow the fee to be waived. So I'm going to give out some flyers with that information. Um, if you're from New Jersey, I'm expecting you to be there in support of Recovery Month. If you just want to travel in September and come back to New Jersey, um, please come hang out with us and help us celebrate Recovery Month. Um, I also encourage you to start your own Recovery Month event in your city and state where you live in. There can never be enough events or support um, of Recovery Month. So thank you for letting me share that information. With thank you for coming. Um, so the one thing that, I, that I'm working on right now is um, I, I'm floating a proposal for a, uh, a monthly um, anti-war protests here in Newark, uh, but, but not just to protest that one day, but to see it as an organizing drive where we, where we pick the, the area around where we'll have the protests, and we aim to connect with the community. I've been working hand in glove with the uh, Green Party on this uh, over the last several months. We've had several protests against the war. Um, Seth was uh, uh, participated, Diane, Diane right? Diane. Yeah. Diane uh, participated, you know, uh, a lot of folks were here. Uh, but anyway, so so the idea is that we, in between our monthly protests, we get out and we get the community, we talk to everyone in the community, we get to know them, they get to know us, and we invite their participation, and we also use it as an opportunity to possibly address other issues that are coming up in the community uh, uh, as a venue and invite folks to participate along those lines. So that's the thing that, that that I have on the floor. All right, thanks. All right, guys, just real quick, I want to read a message to you from Jim Brash. Um, he's the co-chair of the GPNJ Black Caucus and put this panel together. He says, thank you. He says, thank you to all the panelists on behalf of the GPNJ Black thank Caucus. You for the invitation. To my fellow Greens in the audience for their thoughtful responses and for taking the time to discuss, listen, and learn about issues of importance to the black community. And um, for those who are interested in topics like this, the National Black Caucus will be hosting a workshop tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. So um, if you want to continue the discussion, join us. And thank you for coming. Enjoy Newark and New Jersey. Well, I almost neglected. I have one final shameless plug. 
I, I'm the curator of an um, open mic spoken word event. Those of you who like poetry, spoken word, original talent, I host uh, an event at the Source of Knowledge Bookstore, which is not too far from here, downtown North, um, every third Friday. So next week, if you're in town, um, you'll have an amazing time hearing some great talent. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.